reconvene the Board of Finance uh, for Monday, October 19th at 5.35 p.m. And the first item on the agenda is a motion to adopt the agenda. Would someone like to make that motion? So moved. Second. Excellent, any discussion, amendments? Are we good, um, Catherine, or do we need any changes? Okay, uh, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of adopting the motion as presented, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Um, this brings us to the public forum. Um, uh, and um, Jordan or Catherine, I see uh, Councillor Jang needs to be promoted. He's as an attendee. So, um, welcome, Councillor Jang. Um, are there any members of the public signed up for the public forum? There are no members of the public signed up for public forum. Okay. Um, then I will close the public forum at 5.36 p.m. and uh, move to the consent agenda. And we're welcome. There's a proposed motion to adopt the consent agenda and take the actions indicated. If any members are ready to do that. Councilor Paul. Um, thanks. I'd like, I'll make a motion to adopt the consent agenda and take the actions indicated. Um, I do have one um, question, um, but I can wait for a second if you'd like. Second. Great. Go ahead with your question. Okay. Councilor Paul. Thank you. Um, so those are the minutes for September 14, 21, October 5th. Um, all of them are five days beyond the meeting date. And I'd like to know when those were posted, um, where they were posted within the five days, um, uh, and would like to know what the plan is for having those posted regularly five days um, within, with five days or less from the meeting date. Catherine, you wanna to speak to that? Um, I think Rich is probably in the best person to speak to that um, as he works directly with our minute taker. So um, I see he's just taken himself off mute. Uh, yeah, so this is Rich Goodwin. Um, after each uh, meeting, Board of Finance meeting, I, I collect the votes um, for all the agenda items and they're forward over to Lori and I will ensure that those draft minutes are actually posted with votes, you know, within a day. And then we will get back those minutes from the scribe. Uh, I can't promise on how quick they can turn that around, but I can make the commitment that uh, Board of Finance minutes will be posted within one day because I am recording all votes and forwarding that over to Lori and Lori uh, will ensure that they are released. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. That's what Paul. Um, yeah, that's. I mean that that addresses my question. I mean, I've, I've as I've said many many times, I would prefer to have minutes that, that actually um, speak to what happens at the meeting and not just simply motion was made, motion was passed. These are the yes and no votes, so that those people who aren't here. And many years from now, we'll be able to go back and truly understand what happened at the meeting, if at all possible. But anyway, I've made the motion and uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've had a motion and a second. Any further discussions? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And um, just lost my agenda here. Sorry. Um, what did I do? Um, someone's in front of them if they can announce the next item. 
Sure, I would move the next item, which is reclassification of custodian one position at Burlington Parks, Recreation and Waterfront. I would uh, move adoption of the attached resolution and recommend to the council to authorize the reclassification of the position as outlined below. Great, thank you, Councilor Pine. Is there a second? Go ahead, Councilor Paul. I mean, sorry, a second. Thank you for, That's okay. for, any, further, for any further discussion. <laughs> Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. And that brings us to 4.02. I've got my agenda back here. Authorization to execute contracts with the on-call water resources excavation contractors. Uh, another DPW item. Um, how would the board like to proceed on this? I would move approval. Uh, which is to recommend the city council authorize the director of public works to execute an on-call or on-call contracts with five qualified water resources, excavation contractors to include Cortland Construction Company, Dirt Tech Company, Engineers Construction, Parker Excavation, and SD Ireland companies, each with a maximum limiting amount of $200,000 with a maximum limiting amount of $500,000 for all the contracts in total subject to review and approval by the chief administrative officer and city attorney. Excellent, thank you, Councillor Pine. Is there a second? Second by President Tracy. Uh, discussion of the item. Uh, seeing no questions, um, we will go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Martin and Chapin. Uh, 4.03 now, Colchester Avenue side path project, authorization to amend project budget. Um, uh, Chapin, would you like to kick this off? I think senior, senior engineer Susan Molzon and uh, engineer Olivia Doris are here to uh, provide a brief overview. Okay, great. Welcome, Susan and Olivia. Why don't we go ahead and do that, Susan? Yep, thank you. Um, so this, what we're asking for approval for is a budget amendment. Um, this project has been ongoing. We did start construction um, this spring. The construction was delayed due to COVID. We got a little bit of a later start than anticipated. Um, so as a result, we are carrying forward money from FY20 into FY21 as we um, continue and wrap up construction. Uh, we are now almost finished uh, and final complete with construction. Great, Councilor Pine. Just one question, uh, Susan, if, um, if you would, you know, we're, we're four months into the um, FY21 and would this normally happen at the close of a fiscal year as opposed to a quarter of the way through it or a third of the um, way through This is happening now just because of the, the need for the funds for construction. Um, so yeah, typically as we, as we wrap up the one fiscal year um, and roll in whatever was not spent into the next fiscal year. So this timing is, is fairly typical or customary? Yes, I believe so. Okay, thank you. Further, further discussion. Um, I think we still need a. Uh, I don't think I've gotten a motion uh, for this yet either. So, further discussion, or are we ready for a motion? That's all. Thanks. Um, I'll make a motion. Um, uh, just a moment, please. Um, I'll make a motion to approve and recommend that the council authorize the chief administrative officer or her designee to effect all necessary budget amendments and transfers of funds uh, from the above reference funding sources as needed to carry over the unused 
uh, FY20 funds into FY21, which will increase the approved FY21 budget by $102,444.63 from uh, $342,000 to $444,444, I'm sorry, $440.63. Second. Thank you, Councillor Pine. Thank you, Councillor Paul. Uh, further discussion at this point? If not, um, we will go to a vote. Um, and uh, it is helpful if, um, uh, if it, all uh, board of finance members can have their, um, you're, you're muted, Councilor Jang. If you could unmute yourself, that'd be helpful. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. And that brings us to 4.04, authorization to execute an easement deed for the Pease Grain parking lot at Fort College Street to New England Central Railroad and CD properties in support of a passenger rail project for approximately 635 square foot area. DPW item, why don't we just take a moment? I mean, this is a sign of some progress um, on this uh, uh, breakthrough um, for how we move forward with passenger rail um, uh, while keeping the rail footprint on the waterfront uh, uh, minimized. Uh, Chapin, could you kind of tee this off for Norm if it's better to have Norm do it? Like to remind people of uh, the kind of need for this and where it came from. I'm Just happy to overall. jump in. And then I'll hand it to you, Norm, is that uh, yeah. we're managing a number of uh, complexities on the waterfront to really achieve this, this, um, very successful collaborative uh, arrangement here where we limit the footprint of the rail on the waterfront. Uh, we achieve passenger rail. Uh, we achieve moving the bike path to the west side of the tracks, which has been a long held priority for the city. And this one kind of uh, minor uh, easement here is a key piece of shifting the rail and allowing the bike path to move to the west and the rail slightly to the east. Norm, take it away. Yes, yeah, so I've um, been working with VTrans um, from Mount Rail Systems and more recently with uh, Genesee, Wyoming and indirectly CV Properties. Uh, the uh, VRS is doing some early release work for this passenger rail project. Passenger rail project is going to start in 2021, but there's early release work that's really effectively relocating um, track and realigning track. And this realignment ties back to uh, keeping to a single track that uh, v VRS has worked very cooperatively with us to achieve that objective, along with storing passenger rail within the rail yard itself. So this small piece is important because uh, they are actually going on to track that's not of their own. So north of College Street is owned by actually CV Properties, but is leased and operated by New England Central Railroad. And so I tried to explain the complexity of that within this document. And we are working really on a very short timetable to make this happen. And you'll see in the packet, there were changes to the document from the first day it was posted till Friday late afternoon. And the reason being is we're negotiating with uh, New England Central and CV properties. Specifically, there, there was clarification on the easement about uh, who was gonna maintain the fence line adjacent to the rail itself. And frankly, we historically have maintained that fence line. So there was easement changes that needed to happen that basically narrowed the field of, or narrowed or reduced the amount of square footage for this easement. So. Originally you saw in your documents uh, 600, 600 some odd square feet. This has been reduced now to 338 square feet. So you should see the revised updated documents. There will also be some, probably a side agreement in terms of memorandum of understanding in terms of how we will deal with the fence line and that we, we as a city would be responsible for that. Our history has been that we maintain this fence line, the extruded aluminum black decorative fence and so this is not anything unusual for us to be expected of us. So we're, we're uh, working very quickly to, to make this happen because 
uh, VRS needs to get this rail realigned before frost hits the ground. So that's why we're moving quickly. Great. Um, I think was that a hand, Councillor Paul? Did you... No, okay. saying right. saying hello to someone. Okay. Great. And I've got Councillor Pine and then President Tracy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The um, question I have for Norm and Chapin is: um, <clears throat> I know you 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 want to keep. Uh, certain guardrails around projects and, and we need to keep them moving. And I know this one is really about passenger rail. Does it have any benefit to the city in terms of the discussions about realignment in, for the for the bike path at all? Or is there no connection whatsoever to that? Well, it all it all ties together. We are um, we, we've had a lot of conversations about making a, uh, a joint a singly a, a project that is singly managed by v, v trans themselves but contracts both the bike path realignment and the passenger rail project at the same time to lessen the impact to the waterfront and the businesses on the waterfront, particularly LCT um, and also Echo and um, Spirit of Ethan Allen, all these businesses that are affected by how this work is constructed and sequenced is important. And if we get behind with this element or the complexity of the bureaucracies of NECR, it affects so many different things behind it. So this is critically important, though it's a small element of what's expected of the city. It, it's amazing how it can really kind of mess things up from from a construction management standpoint, project management standpoint, and the businesses that are adjacent to it. So I would move it. I would move that the Board of Finance um, recommend to the City Council. Uh, the, to authorize the mayor to execute easement documents pertaining permitting CV Properties Inc. and New England Central Railroad Inc. to create a rail safety setback corridor over an approximate 338 square foot section of the Pease Grain lot property. Thank you, Councillor Pine. Seconded, I believe, by Councillor Paul. Um, President Tracy, did you still have a question? Yeah, I just had two questions and I really appreciate the work, uh, Engineer Baldwin, just from everything you've done to move this project along and help facilitate this compromise um, position. Um, two things that weren't clear to me were uh, the term of the easement. Um, like, is this a permanent easement? Is there a lease term? Because um, I remember that the prior easement that we had for use of the bike path had a certain term to it. Yeah. And then is there um, any like are they is there any compensation changing hands or is this sort of just part of the broader the broader compromise? So there's there's no compensation exchanged. It's it's a straight easement for as long as there there is a continued use of that easement for the purposes of rail service. So there's a condition in there and attorneys can speak more directly to it that if they no longer make use of that, then it reverts back to our our full control. Okay, all right, and there's a chunk taken out on sort of the east side. Was there a potential to gain back some land on the other side, or is it is that really just in order to create the the like for a land swap, or is the land swap really the, the west side of the bike path? Is that more what we're getting from it? So what it is is by by changing the alignment of the path of the rail system. It requires to that straight straight alignment requires to take a sliver of land on the east side and doesn't provide us any additional benefit for land swap or exchange. CV properties is not coming to us with any interest or need in doing any of this thing, any of this work or any of this property exchange. It's really NECR and VTrans who are asking to have right of entry onto their their easement and also the rail service. And so we're we're working with uh people in Jacksonville, Florida with uh, Genesee, Wyoming, and we're dealing with CV properties and Canadian National uh, Rail Service. So it's, uh, this is small potatoes for them, but it's really important to us. Okay, understood. Thank you, President Tracy. It really does. It's a game of inches on the waterfront. And but for this realignment of the rail, uh, the ability to put a full width bike path on the west side of the tracks, uh, would be called into question. So uh, the, right. really the, the the two fit together uh, very closely to, to snake them through on the waterfront in this new alignment. 
Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Councilor Jane. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I hope you you better. You you sound a little bit different. I, I don't know why. Me? Uh, yes. I'm good. I'm, thank you, Councilor Jane. No, I'm 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 great. <laughs> in fact, good. perfect. Um, so today I had a walk meeting at the waterfront, and I noticed also there were a lot of projects work happening at the railroad, right? And was just wondering if you can explain the parallel between city council, board of finance, voting on items and the work also happening. Is what we voting right now um, already the project, it, it's already, it already started? Is it already running? No, or there's, well, they're, they're, pro, they're, they're doing early release work, but it's primarily focusing on the, uh, the loading dock itself or the passenger rail loading area itself to dismantle that area. And then right now our, our people are looking to do utility work in the College Street right away in advance of the work that's being talked about in terms of the rail realignment. And the rail, just, just to give you context, the work that they're doing this fall is to set the alignment of the track, but also the elevation of the track so they can begin work next spring for the development of the passenger rail um, loading area itself, because it, those elevations are important to building the balance of the work. Wonderful. And lastly, when should we expect this project to finish and to receive the first railroad, the first train from New York yeah, to Burlington? Well, I, I believe that they're starting construction this coming season, 2021, and it'll probably be at least one, maybe two seasons worth of work. Okay, thank you for all you do. Yep. E-Trans is hoping to start passenger rail by the end of 2021. It's an exceedingly tight schedule. Uh, and to Norm's point, construction will start early in 2021 and will run throughout the season. And so the, the bike path work in this area parallels that and hopefully is finished on the, the same. Hopefully the intent, the uh, desire is for all of this work to go out to bid together and to be constructed together so that um, it's fully coordinated and that the bike path in the new alignment on the west side of the tracks is also built on that 21 timetable. Yeah, my understanding is that BTRAN is going to bid this in potentially early December for the scope of work for 2021. Yeah. That includes our bike path. Yes. So, which is a good preview. Maybe we should just spend a moment on that. It's sort of off topic, but do we, since when, um, what, what, what should the council, what should the board expect? Maybe this is a kind of responsive to Councilor Jang's question. In terms of uh, additional council approvals here, um, there, what, 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 what do you would expect bringing back to the board and on what kind of time, time table for the broader um, realignment effort? Well, there's, there's certainly property acquisitions that need to occur that, that the city needs particularly with LCT. There's also some additional easements that need to get approved on the west side of the tracks adjacent to College Street. There's a controller box that needs to be installed there to with a new signalization. So there's little pieces, parts here and there, but I think the biggest thing is probably property rights for LCT where there's actual takings that need to occur um, to deal with that realignment. Okay. And then the council will see the finance and maintenance agreement uh, between VTRANS and the city that specifies how the construction will be done and what uh, responsibilities the city will have during that construction. Okay, yeah. Councilor Jane. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And it seemed that whole zone in the next couple of years will be a working zone, a construction zone, you know? And was just wondering when will we hear uh, more about the connection between Champlain Parkway and uh, Battery Park. I believe, you know, you guys are very close in putting that project forward. And ex when should we expect communication about that, do you think? I'm not sure, you said Champlain Parkway and what? I mean, Pine Street maybe and Battery Street. Um, I think we, we are working actively right now, Councillor Jang, on both um, 
responses to the um, kind of the follow up on the latest round of environmental justice uh, testimony um, and process regarding the Champlain Parkway, as well as the um, in some ways related issue about the uh, uh, rail yard enterprise project, the separate project. Um, and uh, we have a lot of work going on on that shortly. And I, I don't have a timetable for you offhand on exactly when you should expect that coming back, but it, it is relatively, ho hopefully relatively soon, we'll have more to uh, bring to the, to the council regarding that. Do you, do you want to add anything to that, Chapin? <coughs> no, we, uh, we're, we're excited about the Rail Yard Enterprise Project and have some active conversations on that we hope to be able to brief you on soon. Thank you. Okay. Um, I believe we have a motion. We do have a, a motion, sure, motion and second from uh, Councillor Pine and Councillor Paul. Um, was that a hand, President Tracy? Did you have a question on this? Okay, so maybe we're ready to go to a vote. Um, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Norm and Chapin. Excellent. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, two more, two more item, items. 4.05. Um, this is a retitling and reclassification of the opioid policy manager <clears throat> to the public health equity manager position. Um, there were some communications over the course of the day uh, from Councillor Hansen, and um, so there were some changes that I. I uh, believe maybe Jordan, you could help me out here. Have the changes been posted to these documents that are up now? Did I ask which, which um, uh, I mean, there's one that's um, red line, there's, there's a red line and a clean, which are I the same. There's the original, which one are we, which one are we, moving forward with. Yeah. Um, Jordan did confirm in the chat that Councillor Hansen's proposed edits have been incorporated into, I assume she's having trouble with her mic, so she can't speak, but maybe you could chat further. Uh, Jordan, the- Sorry, right, I think um, I'm, there we are. Okay. Um, I So the updated, um, Job description is listed in the agenda as updated, I believe. Okay. Okay. And, and what are the changes from the one that we saw? I apologize, I'm speaking out of order. Um, what are the changes from the one that we saw on Friday? Um, there were a few uh, very small um, changes to the um, some of the items under central job functions. Um, some things that had been inadvertently taken out of the um, original position were added back in. Um, and uh, there were there was language added. Um, uh, I'm just pulling up the version now. There was language added on one of the bullets to take um, to add clarity that around um, that that the public health crisis was caused by systemic issues such as racism and economic inequality. Um, Go ahead, Councilor Paul. Thank you. I mean, I apologize, but um, you know, to post a change at 4:22 in the afternoon um, without some other version of redlining, it, it makes it very difficult to follow what exactly the changes are. When you say they're minor, if it's one word or two words, but if it's a if it's something more significant, I I can't put them side by side. And um, you know, would like to know what those changes are specifically. 
So I might be able to help here just in that I think um, Jordan is correct that they are relatively minor changes um, that were recommended by Councillor Hansen this afternoon. I can put those in the chat to show um, and speak to what those are if that's helpful. Um, I think um, I'll do that unless unless otherwise directed. I think the um, uh, maybe maybe what I could uh they were very minor in nature. They were um, changes that Councillor Hansen had requested, um, just to clarify that uh, language around, um, maybe a little bit more specifically around the, that the public health crisis was related to um, systemic racism. Um, so I guess what I would ask Mr. Mayor is if we can go uh, page by page and understand exactly what the changes are from the one that we received on Friday. Yep. If you can just give me a minute, I will share my screen to show that. Okay, so the first change was that in the initial version that was posted on Friday, um, the uh, demonstrated expertise in developing and implementing successful public health policies that had been taken out and now it's added back in. Um, the other change was to add in this clause here caused by systemic issues such as racism and economic inequality. And the other change was um, sorry, I'm just trying to find it in my notes in one window and then um, was adding this right here and other drug abuses in our community. And those were the um, three changes. Hey. Councillor Paul, go ahead. Thank you. Um, if you could, um, if you could, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so I was not aware that you were looking for changes over the weekend. Um, and I thought we were just gonna simply be talking about them, but um, uh, I, I think it would be helpful if someone wanted to make that presentation and I have a number of changes that I would like to suggest as well. Sorry, I didn't follow your, your last. Um, what, I, what I'm saying someone is would I, make what, what presentation exactly are you saying? Well, I think it would be, I mean, this is an important position. It's being um, significantly restructured. It's being taken out of the police department. Um, not, I mean, just speaking for myself, I'm not really sure why it's going in innovation and technology when it's really a public health issue. Um, and I have a number of questions, but I was hoping that maybe someone wanted to speak to this beforehand. Sure. And, and, or, or I'll ask the questions, whatever you prefer. Sure. Um, so the... Um, so the, the concept of, um, a public health equity position, um, 
being created um, is one that goes back uh, to um, the, de the declaration of racism as a public health emergency in July. Um, one of the commitments that I made um, in that declaration was to try to create this position um, and um, to, uh, and, and I've been pursuing it since. Um, we, um, in the um, restructuring of this position have consulted extensively with the Racial Justice Alliance um, and uh, um, in her role as, um, you know, it's, it's not directly on point with uh, policing. I have also consulted uh, some with Councillor Hightower on this, who are, uh, I know is on, on, the, on the meeting. And, um, uh, and I think others too, in kind of coming forward with this proposal. The um, reason it, that I'm proposing moving it to the um, chief innovation officer's purview is um, stems from uh, the uh, basically um, the track record that Brian has in comparable initiatives of getting kind of new uh, uh, efforts off the ground. Um, I see this in some ways like uh, the work he took on um, in the early stages of permit reform, ultimately resulting in uh, the creation of new permitting inspections department. Brian, uh, in his innovation role, played a lot, you know, did a lot of the kind of early uh, detailed collaborative work necessary to kind of develop consensus and, and get this, get that department um, off the ground. Similarly with the early learning initiative, um, uh, Brian uh, did years of sort of preliminary innovation work uh, before ultimately that function was moved over into um, CEDO. I, I think it's likely that something comparable will happen here. I don't necessarily think that the, this is the chief, chief innovation officer department, you know, I, I innovation and technology department is where this uh, position should ultimately reside. Um, but during this sort of uh, startup phase, um, uh, I'm uh, optimistic. I know Brian, Brian has the capacity to provide the right oversight. It will also mean that, um, you know, I have a lot of personal interest in, in the th three different um, areas that this person will be working in. And um, Brian, you know, as the CIO has a lot of access to me and, and will help make sure that in these critical early stages, um, the person has the proper mayoral support and alignment as well. So uh, those are what I saw, you know, that's sort of how, and I, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to kind of kind of lay that out if, um, and, and uh, I think it's important to know, you know, where ultimately it resides, I think remains to be seen. I, I think that this I, I'm, a, I'm, you know, I don't think tonight is the place to sort of fully get into it, but I, I really think we have to think about public health differently um, as a city going forward. And that's part of the reason is, is in the job description for creating this position. Um, I think ultimately we may want to consider a number of functions that are currently kind of distributed around the city uh, being in a different place. And, um, uh, but that's going to take some real effort to get us to that point. Brian, do you want to add anything to kind of the general presentation? Um, yeah. and, and I, you know, um, sorry for not, you know, I'm happy to speak further. Councilor Paul would be helpful to the kind of three major areas uh, and why that they've kind of been grouped here, if that would be helpful, but um, I'm not sure that would be helpful. So um, I'll, I'll pause there and, and see if, where, where else would you like us to present? Um. Well, if you're asking me, uh, you know, that, um, I mean, I, you know, I, I agree and I agree. I agree that, you know, Brian has had uh, um, taken on many things that were difficult and uh, has made them with, along with, I'm sure, help from many others, made them very successful. Um, he'd be the first person I would imagine to say that. Um, the, um, uh, and I do think that it is something that we, want to be successful um, and to uh, really 
uh, you know, keep a close eye on and see if it's working, that kind of thing. Um, you know, I, I am a little, you know, I, I guess my questions are, um, uh, you know, this, this, this position was not limited service before. Um, not really sure why it needs to be limited service now. Um, we are replacing a position and even though the job description may be different, I am not a big fan of limited service. Um, especially in this case when we really are to some degree replacing someone. Um, and then the other, um, the other issue, it, which is I think a small one is on the top of page three. Um, I'm not really sure why the idea of being self-motivated and self-directed was taken out. Um, I think all employees should be self-motivated and self-directed. So I would encourage putting that back in. Thank you, Councilor Pollitt. Um, that's helpful on both counts. I, I, um, does anyone want to speak to why this was reclassified as limited service? I, I've not been focused on that. Um, I, Brian. Just a point of clarification. I, I think, I thought it was limited service before and was remaining limited service. Uh, uh, Jackie was with the city for longer than three years. Um, okay. Then it may be a question that's beyond me and I can um, look into it, but, but my understanding was we were moving one limited service position to another limited service position. Okay. Um, Could, I mean, Councilor Paul's right, right. Like, she was once she just hit her fourth year anniversary, so uh, it would have been typical for it to have been converted by now if um, that should have, that, basically that's our policy, so. Um, I'm unclear on the facts there. Maybe someone could confirm that while we're having further discussion here. Uh, Councilor Jing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Brian, for being here. I think along the same line as Councilor Paul, I believe that this position is so loaded with so much language and so many different scope of, uh, scope of work. Uh, not to mention also the fact that it is now being held at the technology and innovation department. And looking at the job description, I mean, some elements of Jackie's work uh, were really hands-on, you know, in the field, but it seems all those elements now are missing in this reclassification. And uh, I think it would be great you know, to maybe make a distinction between um, the fight against racism or declaration of racism as a public health emergency and make the distinction with the, the fight against the opiate crisis. And also maybe it would be great as a starting point to look into the guidance from the, uh, the public health, the board of health of the city of Burlington. Um, maybe we're just wondering what type of discussion have you had with them about this specific position? What, 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 what discussion have you had with them and uh, have they approved this as well? Hey, Councilor Chang, um, first of all, with respect to, um, <clears throat> so we are adding significant responsibilities to this position um, and uh, we, I think it is also, you're right that <laughs> the vision of this position is shifting from one that has uh, did have some real field responsibilities to one that does not. That is being done in anticipation in part that um, uh, not because we're going to abandon that work um, to the contrary, that we are going to add capacity to do that kind of field work um, through these community service liaisons in the weeks to come. Um, I, uh, uh, it is very much my hope um, this could slip, but that we have a proposal in front of the Board of Financing Council um, to uh, at our next meeting to um, move forward. This too is something that uh, Councilor Hightower and I uh, uh, have, have discussed in her 
you know, and, and that the whole, her whole joint committee is discussed and there seemed to be strong um, support for among the joint committee of creating these CSL positions, community service liaison positions that would <clears throat> take on that uh, field work and in fact, expand the field work that, that the city has the ability to do uh, following up on uh, opioid and, and mental health um, uh, and other kind of homelessness uh, issues. Uh, so hopefully that explains that, that change. Um, with respect to the Board of Health, I have had, um, uh, I, I don't believe this um, uh, job description has at this point gone, formally gone to the Board of Health for, for, for comment. Um, I will say um, my understanding is the Board of Health has been very supportive of our sort of general harm reduction efforts uh, in the way we've combated the opioid um, effort. And I've had individual conversations um, with uh, and, and the, the Board of Health was very supportive also, I believe, and I think may have taken formal action. Um, maybe someone else on the call knows more uh, regarding the uh, public health declaration, racism as a public health declaration. I, I believe they formally endorsed that. It's possible I'm, um, maybe someone else could confirm that, but I, I'm pretty sure they did. So, um, and, I, and I have had with, some members um, informal communications and and uh, you know believe them to be quite supportive of uh, the move in, in this direction and the general discussion about possible kind of expanded um, public health uh, capacity uh, within the city is something that um, I know individual members of, of the board support. Um, it would be my hope. I, I guess I'll just say that we not um, you know it's been. Um, I feel great urgency to be moving forward um, with the uh, public health declaration work, um, getting this job description approved um, tonight. Uh, you know, if, if we can't if we can't move for, forward with approval tonight of the job description, it will mean setting back the listing of the position another three weeks until we meet again, and. Um, I um, am hoping that we uh, that, that that we can avoid that. It would this is um, work. I think the public is demanding that we move forward with quickly. There will be many questions to be answered in the future um, about where the city's work goes. Mm -hmm. I think the having this position will help us answer that that work. Yes. Answer those uh, questions. Yes. Uh, thank you. I mean, I think somewhat it was answered, but I think it would be imperative also to highlight that. Uh, you know, we all agree that this is needed, this is important, but sometimes it's the, 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 the way we do it, I think is sometimes a little bit confusing. Um, and I think here it has, it, 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 there is so many uh, moving pieces in one self-starter uh, position that the city will be not creating, but upgrading and was also wondering if you can speak around um, the idea that the city did freeze any new hirings. And I hear new positions on top of this one will be created. Have we got out of that zone, red zone, where we feel comfortable now to bring new people in uh, the city, knowing that we're still experiencing uh, some hardship in terms of the budget, uh, the sell tax, et cetera, and et cetera. And was just wondering if you can speak to that because I yes. see a level of increase of position being created now. Great, yes, happy to happy to speak to to that. Um, and I also just uh, maybe people see it in the chat, but the um, the position was reclassified in in 2019. So um, I, I would given, and so it's been budgeted at that level here. I, I um, not to create policy on the fly, but uh, I, um, maybe Catherine in a moment, we can come to you and given that, um, can we make, you know, was that a basically an oversight that that was turned back to limited service? Um, and can that, could that remain a regular position? Uh, we'll let you speak on that in a minute. To answer Councillor Jang's um, point about the hiring freeze, um, we are still in a hiring freeze. The Hiring freeze um, uh, has some uh, limited and I think well-defined exceptions to it. Um, one of them has been within 
you know, when we passed the budget, we explicitly created um, two funds, one for racial justice and one for um, police transformation. And so, you know, again, uh, not the CSLs is not in front of you tonight, but it, it would be um, the proposal that I have talked some publicly about um, is that we would use uh, some of that police transformation fund to move forward with this um, urgent police transformation work. So that is, those are uh, funded positions that I see as separate from the um, hiring freeze with vacancies um, on existing uh, positions. Further, um, we are preparing a full update for this board on the November 9th meeting, the next time we convene to speak to the broader questions about where we are with the finances and, and whether we um, are in position to make a, a change um, in posture, you know, go back, revert to more normal times with respect to the hiring freeze. We'll have that answer for you the next, the next time we meet. Um, we're working hard on it right now. Thank you. Um, Councillor Pine. Councillor Pine, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, there's a lot of substantive issues here. I just want to point out one minor typo that I think deserves to be addressed, um, if I could. Um, it is the first paragraph of the second page. Uh, it is the last sentence. It says, a problem-solving model to eradicating system racism as a public health strategy. I think we all know it's meant there, but it seems like it ought to be caught and since I caught it I'm going to point it out <laughs> great <laughs> um, the uh, could you just tell us what a 20 a grade 21 um, it doesn't say on the on the uh, job description uh, what that translates to for um, you know a step 121 what would that be for starting salary I'm just curious I've got that information for you the step one of that grade is 72,554. And it goes up to step 15, which is 86,600. That's fully maxed out, Lynn, the steps that you just said there? Yes. Yeah, one, one to 15 is the max. Yeah. Okay. So the, I think I, I think I understand what the intention is with this position as really a, um, a revisioning for the city's role in, in the areas of um, public health, including uh, the issues which we've been discussing around systemic racism as a public health um, issue, as well as um, opioid addiction. And, um, and bringing in that more holistic approach is something that um, I've believed in and advocated for for quite some time. So I think um, the question about you know regular or limited service is one that um you know i'll trust the administration to figure that one out i think to the extent that it is a um it's always a little more attractive in terms of attracting people for this type of position when you can uh, include them in the retirement system on day one as opposed to waiting for some indefinite period of time as somebody who started as limited service and um ended up um surpassing limited service but it's still uh, it, it it does create a bit of a, of a a little bit of soreness in the in the I, I think on the feeling of the employee when they know that um, they're surrounded by people who are regular and they're in a limited service status, even though the goal is to build um, you know a permanent capacity for the city to play this role, which I think is is essential. I think it's really exciting to be talking about the city playing a a actual role, uh, unlike any other community in Vermont, in in addressing. Uh, public health. We address public safety, but we somehow have not really been grappling with, with public health as a as a community for a very long time. So, I I think this is a good direction. I I do uh, think it's worth uh, you know sort of a cautionary note that um, anything that suggests this will sort of lessen the focus on the uh, uh, addiction crisis, I think is is just something to, to to make note of and to be aware of the fact that. Um, at least this counselor would not uh, would not like to see that. I don't believe that's what you're doing, but I just want, I think it deserves to be called out, but that's not the intention here is to 
um, divert attention or resources at all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pine. Um, and I guess I'll just echo, echo um, I, I definitely don't think our work is, well, I guess it's not quite echo. Let me just say clearly, I don't believe our work is done um, responding to the opioid crisis. I do, um, uh, um, we, we will continue to, to bring uh, considerable attention and ongoing fo focus to bear. The community stat process continues, the work that's owed this council for other, you know, other, other innovations is, is ongoing. I am hopeful. Um, that as we um, get out of the, as the pandemic um, recedes, we may, I, I'm quite, I'm hopeful we will uh, return to the kind of better footing that we were on, um, the improved footing we were on uh, with the opioid crisis. Um, uh, but I do think we have years of work ahead of us to um, properly, you know, we're, we're gonna, the, the fallout from this crisis uh, is gonna, um, extend for, for years to come and we're going to be dealing with it. Um, in some ways I'm proposing that we expand the city's uh, ability to do hands-on work in that crisis with these CSL officers. Again, not to get, you know, that'll be another debate for another night, but I hope it is, we should, I guess I am asking the, the board to kind of see these actions coming together. I'm asking for approval tonight on the manager position so we can get that, uh, um, that process moving and the hiring process moving, there is this further, I am committing to you, there is this further proposal coming that will expand our field capacity to actually um, engage and, and make sure we're actually doing more of what this position was doing uh, when Jackie was in it in terms of field action. So sorry to repeat that point, but I think it is an important one. Um, Catherine, did you wanna weigh in on the limited service versus full-time in any way? Um, I will consult with my HR colleagues, but I believe that they will support me in um, offering it as a regular position. I mean, if that's what it was, um, I believe the retirement fund um, can handle that. We will budget appropriately starting next year. So that would be my recommendation. I, I, I would agree that. with that. Great. Thank you, Lynn. Um, President Tracy, were you trying to keep us on time here or did you have a, were you trying to weigh in here? I was trying to weigh in, um, but I do, I'm con conscious of the time and that we have another item on the, the agenda. I just wanted to weigh in and say that, you know, I do think that, that on the one hand, I, you know, I, I certainly hear you, Mayor, about wanting to move this forward. I think that, uh, and the idea of having this be a holistic position, I think is also, um, makes a lot of sense. I think that if we're being reflective and um, self-critical, I think of our efforts uh, with regards to the opiate crisis, I don't know that we've necessarily um, overlaid a you know, racial justice lens as much as we could have or should have to that work. So I think that that's a helpful refocusing lens. A um, Couple things that I'm not necessarily clear on, um, actually three specific things are, you know, sometimes with job descriptions and positions, you see a percentage breakdown. Some, uh, a lot of times in this, in these positions that has to do with grants and um, sort of maintaining the, the terms of a grant. But this, um, this position, I don't necessarily see like a percentage breakdown. And so just wanting to understand how to that, to some of these questions really about like the, how you maintain focus on the opiate crisis while also dealing with this much broader purview, how like, is, do you see that percentage breakdown happening? Is there a percentage breakdown? Um, is that realistic to think, or is it just everything is gonna kind of bleed together all the time? Um, and if there is some sort of breakdown, I guess like, or other accountability mechanisms for making sure that some of that other work doesn't get lost. Like, do you see a, do you see a percentage breakdown here? Or do you think that it's just kind of all up in the air at this point? We're gonna have to see how it plays out, Mayor. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I'm not, um, I don't think it's common. I could be wrong, but I don't think it's common for us to, to detail, um, in the job description, a percentage breakdown like that. I think you're right. We often do, uh, when we get into like the budgeting for the upcoming year, um, uh, particularly in CEDO where, uh, where the way in which things are funded, um, and build, uh, needs to be sort of worked out precisely there. We do do that. Um, I, you know, 
I, I think we're going to have to a certain degree, we're moving into new territory here. Um, we're going to have to figure out to some degree. I do kind of think it's going to break down at least initially something along the lines of a third, a third, a third, uh, you know, a third keeping going our, our opioid efforts, a little bit of a shift in from what Jackie was doing again, less field stuff, but definitely continuing the leadership and sort of policy and uh, coordination um, efforts that um, uh, with, with community stat, I see that continuing. Um, I think this person will play a similar function and I, 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 I'm, I, th I would like to attack the racism as a public health crisis in a comparable way. I think that's that multi-agency, data-oriented, uh, rigorous follow-up um, uh, um, accountability model that we kind of pioneered uh, in some ways um, with community stat. I, I, one of the reasons I've been, you know, I, I see this applying a very similar model in some ways real important differences, but a similar model in some ways to the um, public health emergency. Um, I think we're going to have a real partner in UVM Medical Center in that. So I don't think it's entirely going to fall in this position. Um, uh, but uh, I think they will, they will be doing real work there. And then I think, you know, a, a big chunk of time as well is going to go into like this broader exploration of public health and uh, whether we should reorganize ourselves. Um, so I, I'm sure it won't be exactly a, that way, but I see them each as three big roles that are going to need considerable time. I'm sure it's going to vary week by week, month by month. But um, and in terms of accountability, I mean, I think there's a lot of accountability built in here. There's a lot of public attention and council attention on uh, on our opioid efforts and uh, and this public health declaration. So, um, you know, I think if we're making continuing to make progress and continuing to do good work uh, on the opioids. I think they'll be clear if we're backsliding. I think that will also be clear. This, you know, the accountability is built into the metrics to a certain degree. Um, and, you know, we're not quite at that point for evaluating the, I mean, we're definitely not at that point with racism yet. I think we're gonna have to spend, once we really get this thing off the ground, we're gonna spend a lot of the first year developing the metrics by which this uh, effort can be measured. Um, uh, but I think it's fair for you, you know, I'd be happy to entertain, you know, uh, let's talk about how we, we, we bring back regular, um, updates to, to the board and the council about how that work is going. Okay. Thank you. And the other question that I had was about supervision. So there are these two CSL positions Would the idea be for this person to supervise those folks or how would the interaction between these these CSL positions that are being contemplated work in relationship to this position because that's not totally yeah. clear in this memo you're right it's not clear and I don't um, I don't know exactly where we're gonna land on that we um, have been taking you know um, Councillor Hightower uh, in one of our past council meetings um, and at the joint meeting um, weighed in on that other members of the joint committee weighed in on that um, we uh, uh, it, it's, it's not clear at this point. It will be by the time we bring it forward, whether one or both or neither of these positions are, are in consideration right now. Um, we're really trying to, uh, you know, there's a handful of cities around the country that I'm aware of that are really kind of pioneering this uh, kind of transformation of public health, public safety work um, going on. We're looking for models in other cities. Um, when the positions come forward, uh, we will have clarity on there. I don't, I, I'm not necessarily leaning towards this person being the supervision, the supervisor of those. I, 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 uh, I think that's unlikely. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mayor. I do appreciate you having heard the feedback around taking this position out of the police department and would advocate for the same for those other positions. I think that that speaks to kind of the nimbleness that this person will need to have um, in order to, to fulfill the broad scope of job responsibilities. So I like I like that aspect and appreciate your willingness to, to hear that feedback. So thank you for that. Okay, great. I mean, I think it makes sense for this position. I'm not, you know, I hope people will stay open-minded um, about what the right home, you know, I'm trying to stay open-minded. The, the administration is trying to really work Really look, you know, again, figure this out by looking at other cities and, and come back. I don't know where we're going to land. Um, uh, it, I, um, I definitely think there needs to be, um, you know, our, you know, call by call, minute by minute in some 
circumstances coordination with the police department, I, I would caution against, I think it may be a different situation with this, this position for the work it does versus the um, responses that we coordinated responses we want from the, the social workers, but let's, uh, I am, I, I have heard uh, a range of feedback on that uh, and we are trying to really process that and bring to you a comprehensive well thought through proposal. Uh, Councillor Paul. Thank you. Um, so the, uh, the recommend, I would, um, I would make a motion, um, uh, I, to, um, to approve and recommend that the council authorize reclassification and retitling of the opioid policy manager position, um, not, um, as a regular, um, full-time uh, regular service, full-time, exempt, non-union, grade 21 position to public or, yes, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking out loud and they're both, that, that one was a full-time position. So the recommended action that's on board docs is not correct. Um, uh, uh, to a public health equity manager position, a regular service, full-time, exempt, non-union, uh, great 20, I'm sorry, is Rich raising his hand? Am I saying this not right? We can't hear you, Rich, you're muted. I apologize. <clears throat> I, you're, what are you, are you apologizing for? for... I apologize for moving my arm. Oh. oh. <laughs> All right. I thought you were yeah. trying to say something. Um, and then um, would approve um, and recommend to the, that the city council authorize the chief administrative officer to move the associated reallocation of funding um, from the police department to the innovation and technology department. Um, and I would just simply also add as part of the, um, uh, the, uh, the action uh, that the change be made on page three to um, uh, to put back the language at the bottom of the uh, the essential job function to put the last bullet point back in. Great, thank you, Councilor Paul. Is there a second to that motion? Second by, by Councilor Pine. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries unanimously. And um, uh, that moves us to the final item, which I hope can be done quickly. Um, the 5.01, which is a wayfinding project, uh, construction contract, contingency. Um, uh, Councilor Pine. I would move to authorize the department Director of Public Works uh, to use an additional $4,995 in contingency funds, representing 10% for the construction contract with Waterman Site Works for a total of $54,945, subject to review and approval of the City Attorney's Office. Thank you, Councilor Pine. Is there a second? Uh, second by President Tracy. Um, and We'll just say it remains a, a goal of mine somehow to devise a system where um, you know a five thousand dollar budget item uh, does not need to come forward. But um, we haven't figured out how to do that with the uh, also you know subject to these other limits here. So for another day on that, any any um, any discussion? Great. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And we, if there is no objection, we are adjourned as a board of finance at 6.44 p.m. Apologies to everyone that this ran a little bit long. Hopefully we can make up some time in the next 45 minutes here. Over to you, President Tracy. Excellent. All right, I'll call to order the city council meeting um, for uh, Monday, October 19th at 6.45. Um, the for the first thing we'll do is uh, the pledge. Um, so if folks um, want to stand with the pledge. Okay. 
to find the United States of America? The United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty, justice for all. All right. Our next item on the agenda will be uh, the agenda itself. Uh, Councilor Stromberg, may I please have a motion on the agenda? Yep, I move to amend, adopt the agenda as follows. Note revised documents for consent agenda item 5.19, resolution authorization to execute an easement deed for the Peace Green parking lot at 4 College Street to New England Central Railroad and CV properties in support of passenger rail project for approximately a 635 square foot area board of finance per Norm Baldwin and the city attorney's office. Note written materials for consent agenda item 5.21, resolution authorization for easement for urban reserve encroachment by 11 Lakeview Terrace, Councilor Pine per city attorney's office. Remove this agenda item uh, per assistant city attorney student. Um, add to the consent agenda item 5.22, communication Mikkel Cohen uh, regarding backyard campfires with the action to waive the reading, accept the communication and place it on file. Note the Board of Health's recommendation regarding agenda item 6.03 resolution, um, allow permits for safe operation of contained outdoor fires during COVID-19 winter. Councilors Shannon, Paul, Mason, and Carpenter. No proposed amendment for the agenda item per Councillor Shannon. Add to the agenda item 6.04 uh, communication Chief Innovation Officer Brian Lowe regarding uh, re-titling and reclassification of opiate po policy manager to public health equity manager position. Note written materials for the agenda item per Chief of Staff Riddell. No updated redlined version regarding JD for this agenda item per Chief of Staff Riddell. Excellent. Thank you for that. Councilor Stromberg, we have a motion on the agenda. Is there a second to that motion? Seconded by Councilor Pine. Any discussion of our agenda? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, hearing none, uh, the, we now have an agenda, which brings us into our next item, which is um, item number two, a communication regarding City Place. Um, I believe we'll have a little bit of a public session update as well as um, the uh, some action in executive session before coming back to um, the um, rest of our agenda for this evening. So with that, I will um, turn it over to um, the team um, that has been uh, working on this, namely our consultant on the project, uh, Jeff Glassberg. So uh, Jeff, would you like to take it away? Yes, good evening, councilors. Uh, I understand uh, City Attorney Blackwood and Attorney Heath will update the council on the status of the contractual relationship among the city and BTC Mall Associates in executive session. I can briefly report on some signs of progress regarding the project itself. BTC Mall Associates, a property owner, did provide a public presentation of the project via Zoom uh, to the Ward's 2-3 NPA meeting on October 8th. The project architect provided an overview of the program and the project design. And the presentation was a required precursor to the submission of a new zoning application for the proposed project. That permit application was submitted by BTC Mall Associates last week on Thursday, October 15th. The Department of Permitting and Inspection will administer the application review process in accordance with the requirements of the pertinent ordinances and procedures. The application, which documents a primarily residential product comprising it's either 423 or 426 units, I see two different numbers, um, does also presume the restoration of Pine and St. Paul Streets. The project as proposed in the application materials would be constructed in four phases with construction commencing in September of 2021, 
and the phases coming on and mid uh, being completed in mid May of 2023, mid November of 2024, mid May of 2026, and mid November of 2026. I mentioned that phasing in particular because the other update of note is action that was taken by the legislature as part of the recently approved state budget. The <clears throat> legislature provided for a one year extension on the debt issuance deadlines of all TIF districts statewide. So in the case of City Place Burlington and the waterfront dis uh, TIF district in which it sits, the debt issuance deadline for that project would now be extended to June 30 of 2022. It had been 21. But the point, and, and why this is important, is the issuance of debt to support the uh, construction of Pine and St. Paul Street would still have to occur in advance of when the developer's proposed schedule would be completing the project. So debt would have to be issued in June of 2022, and they're talking about a first phase that would come online in May of 2023, with final completion in November of 2026. The point being that from a business perspective, what the city had bargained for was the ability to purchase the completed improvements um, at a point when the project was also complete, providing a source of debt repayment. So the fundamental challenge for the city of having to look at the potential of debt issuance in advance of construction completion still remains. And for the city to assess the ability to solve that problem requires at a minimum fundamental financial information from the developer that we still have yet to see. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I appreciate that. Why don't we go to um, the updates from our legal counsel um, and then um, I can open it up for some questions from counselors um, in open session, understanding that we may, um, that some things may need to be discussed um, based on um, prior premature disclosure issues um, in executive after that. So I assume that Attorney Blackwood will be kind of warning us when we get into that, any, any territory that may cross over into something that needs to be discussed in executive. But I do wanna give counselors a chance to ask questions in, in open session on some of the things that were shared um, just now. So Attorney Blackwood, um, are you able to, to share some updates on the legal side of things? Sure, just a, a quick, um, on the public side, the, the BTC Mall Associates has filed their answer to our complaint, and uh, we are still working on getting mediation scheduled. Um, we would be happy to talk to you about sort of more details of the, the strategy and, and, and uh, details of communications that have been happening um, a, around those issues um, in executive session. Um, but premature disclosure of kind of all the, the strategy that we're thinking about and the um, and and some of the back and forth um, is not really apt for public disclosure at this point. Okay, understood, um, attorney. Um, so, were there questions from counselors with regards to what was sh just shared um, in in open session? Uh, Councilor Hansen, go ahead. I, I see you, Councilor Mason. I'll get you after. Go ahead, Councilor Hansen. Thanks. Um, Attorney Blackwood, could you just summarize um, or characterize what BTC Mall Associates submitted um, or filed in response to our complaint? Um, they, they, what I'd like to do is talk about the, 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 the content of those in executive session because it, whatever I tell you is going to be like, is going to be essentially tainted by our view and our opinion of what those things mean, which is, which I think we should do an executive session. But in, in terms of 
factually what they are, um, that they filed uh, um, an answer to our complaint. They, uh, as, as you may recall, they initially filed a lawsuit against the city and the city's filing came a few hours after theirs and they have withdrawn their complaint and, and instead filed an answer uh, which includes a, a counterclaim back against the city of Burlington. In addition, they have filed a, what's known as a third party complaint against PC construction and brought them into the lawsuit. Okay. Uh, oh, one, more, one other filing, right, Mark, that they filed a response to um, to our motion for uh, for um, preliminary injunction. Is that right? They yes, that's correct. So, so it's an answer, a counterclaim with 12 counts. So we'd be happy to go through those with you. But again, it would require us to kind of put them on our own words. And so I'd rather not do that in open session. They filed um, an opposition to our motion for preliminary injunction and a counterclaim against PCC. Okay. Yeah, if there's any way, I think it would be really helpful for the public. If there's any way you could just maybe in their words instead of in your words or in the words of what was submitted, what the substance of that counterclaim that was filed was. I, I'm happy to take a stab at it, just trying to keep it you know, very simple. But uh, count one is a it's called a declaratory judgment action uh, seeking to have the court confirm that uh, BTC has effectively terminated the development agreement. As you may recall, they attempted, they sent us a letter on September 4th uh, unilaterally announcing that they had terminated the agreement and they want the court to confirm it. So that's count one. Count two is another uh, action for declaratory relief. Uh, asking the court to issue a ruling that both parties have, have uh, together abandoned the permits for the project. Count three um, is a declaratory judgment action uh, asking the court to determine that the, it is impossible uh, for the developer to comply with the development agreement. Count four is uh, a anticipatory breach of contract count. Count five is a claim for detrimental reliance. Um, count six is a breach of covenant of good faith and fair dealing against the city. Count seven is a count for unlawful taking without compensation. And then the rest of the counts are against uh, PCC. Okay, no, I, re I really appreciate that. Thanks for, for sharing that and look forward to hearing um, your, your thoughts on that in the executive session. Sure. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hanson. I have Councillor Mason. Go ahead, Councillor. Thank you, President Tracy. That um, actually was answered the question I had at the time, but um, sort of a follow-up based on what I just heard from Mark. I'm sure the public's interested in knowing sort of timing and what is the next step in this. You know, we've heard earlier um, public statements about trying to get this resolved by year end. I'm just sort of curious, what is, you know, the next step without getting into strategy and what the timing is of that next step? Well, both parties have mutually stated their desire to enter into a mediation session in an attempt to uh, achieve a, a resolution of this dispute without having to go to court. So both parties have, have, have announced that and we are working on that. So we anticipate that the next step would be mediation if we can arrange it. And I'll discuss that more, some of the issues involved with that in, in private uh, executive session. Um, other things that are outstanding, we have served discovery, written discovery on BTC. We have also issued a subpoena to Brookfield. Also, at Councillor Mason? Yes. Okay, I've got Councillor Paulino. Councillor, you're on mute. I have five questions. Uh, I'll try to be quick. Uh, my first question is for Attorney Heath. I know you quickly talked about the counterclaim against PC construction. Um, for those who, uh, like myself, don't really know much about civil law, but um, can you 
it's pretty unusual, I would think, to draw in a either, you know, I'm assuming they were either the GC or a sub um, here uh, into a lawsuit, this kind of law lawsuit. Can you explain what the essential facts stated in the complaint or the countersuit are for their for why they think it's appropriate instead of suing them directly? I'll try to be uh, very terse on this because this does get into sort of my analysis of the claims. And just to be clear, um, I don't be too technical here, but BTC filed a counterclaim against the city. It filed a third party claim against PCC. So that's the term we use. Okay, so that's it's a third party claim. And in essence, what BTC is alleging is that PCC, which is the general contractor for the project, uh, I'm going to try to use their terms, uh, breach their contract by um, providing an unreasonably high uh, uh, guaranteed maximum price contract. That's, that's the specific claim that they're making is that PCC's general, uh, uh, it's, it's guaranteed maximum price was too high. So that's essentially one of their claims. And then the second claim, well, there's four of them, but I'm just narrowing it down to the second one, is that uh, they claim that PCC uh, somehow should have an obligation to defend and indemnify BTC from the claims being made by the city. Yeah, I mean, that seems very strange. I'll just comment on it because our, you know, we didn't enter into a contract with that company. I assume a developer, you know, we say to people, we say to constituents all the time, this is a private development. Um, I'm assuming that private developer could turn around and go to somebody else. Um, but um, my other questions are for Mr. Glassberg, if you have a moment. Are you there? Or I can't see you, or at least. I don't think he's on my screen, so maybe he dropped off. Um, I guess. President Tracy, uh, point of order, do you see? Uh, I do not, I'm looking, but I do not see. I know that sometimes um, given his location, he can have some issues with um, connectivity. So hopefully we can get him back on. Okay, um, I can ask the question and maybe if uh, the, the mayor could shed some light on it. They're not specifically, I think, I think uh, anybody can answer them. I think it's worth just putting them out there and maybe we can talk about them in the executive session or go back to it. But um, my questions were there for and they're related. So it's just, um, I just wanted a quick background. We've heard a lot about the financial documents that are essential and that they haven't been provided for a while. And I think what I wanted to know is just generally, why are we requiring that? What information do you seek to gain from it? And at what point did the prior parties provide those financial documents? So just to get a sense, since there was a change in party um, with the new players, um, at what point, because my, and my point is that other party had provided them early on and we still had this problem of, we don't know if they have the financing. So um, what is it that we're looking, are we looking for like a term sheet or some kind of banking guarantee or? <clears throat> President Tracy, I'm happy to, to speak to that. I mean, we are, we are looking for, fundamentally, we are seeking information that um, will allow the city to um, uh, um, assess and with you, the council, determine what our negotiating position will be in the anticipated mediation. Um, <clears throat> There really hasn't, I think, to kind of compare it back to earlier stages in the construction in this development process isn't exactly on point in that we, you know, we've never uh, been at this stage before um, where we have a party that is in breach of uh, <clears throat> in breach of the agreement and default of the agreement that they have with us. Um, uh, and um, so, uh, you know, what specifically um, what we have asked for, I think, is a matter of public record, isn't it, um, already, uh, Attorney Blackwood? Uh, um, I don't know if you want to kind of, I think we've summarized before publicly what the, those are, but I don't want to speak out of turn if, if that's not accurate. Uh, 
I wish Jeff were here because he may be able to tell us whether he has said that specifically. I don't remember. I mean, I, th I think it's been, certainly it's been clear we're seeking clarity um, uh, about what happened. Brookfield wrote us a letter that is a matter of public record indicating that they had invested $70 million um, in this project and that they would give us an accounting of, of that. Uh, that is certainly a critical, uh, knowing what happened with that $70 million, a critical uh, piece of information um, uh, that has not been provided uh, as, a, as of yet. Um, we're also looking for information regarding the proposed project going forward, um, as well as um, information regarding the makeup of the the new BTC Mall Associates uh, partnership. I think that's a, a good summary of um, basically what we're seeking. I'm all set, President Tracy. Okay, excellent. I don't have any others in the queue um, for questions in public session. Okay, seeing none, I believe we are ready to, for a motion to go um, into executive session. One thing, uh, Councillor uh, Councilor Pine, I'd asked um, Councillor Mason to make that motion. So I'll have Councillor Mason make it. I appreciate you having done so in the past, but I wanted to spread it around this time. So um, one thing for just to note um, for folks is that we do are now having them uh, in response to some of the changes and the requests that were made of us. We've gotten those motions with the specific statutory language, which you'll hear up on board docs along with the folks that we're supposed we're expecting to have an executive session. So um, that is a change that we've made and hopefully we'll, we'll continue along with moving forward, but just want to be uh, mindful of the um, the training that we received last time and act on it. So with that, I'll turn it over to you for a motion, Councilor Mason. Thank you, President Tracy. I would move that uh, for a finding that premature general public knowledge of the city strategy, legal advice, and other information in relation to the pending litigation with BTC Mall Associates would put the city at a substantial disadvantage. Okay, so we have a motion um, on a finding. Um, is there a second seconded by Councilor Pine? Any discussion on the finding? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor of the finding, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Hearing none, that passes unanimously. And now may I please have the second part of the, um, the motion, Councillor Mason. Thank you, President Tracy. Based on that finding, I would move that we go into executive session to consider pending litigation and confidential attorney-client communications pursuant to 1 VSA 313A1E and F. I would note that the individuals that we would invite into executive session in addition to the council and the mayor include the mayor's office staff, the city attorney, Jeffrey Glassberg, if he rejoins us, uh, and Mark Heath. Excellent, okay, we have a motion based on the finding. Okay, I have the second from Councilor Stromberg. Any discussion on that motion to go into executive session? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Hearing none, that passes unanimously and we'll head into executive session for members of the public. Um, we will um, be coming back right around, hopefully right around 7.30 for public forum. Um, if you are interested in signing up for public forum, you may do so by going to um, the city website, burlingtonvt.gov backslash city council backslash public forum. And that way you can um, sign up for public forum should you wish to speak this evening. I will be again getting to that at, at 7.30, uh, right around that time, hopefully. So we'll see you back in a little bit. Counselors, please use the links in your email that you were just sent.
executive session we'll get right into public forum um, if you are a member of the public interested in speaking in the public forum the way to sign up for that uh, that forum is to go to burlingtonbt.gov slash city council which is one word slash public forum which is one word and that will take you to a form that you fill out that automatically feeds um, into a spreadsheet that i have go that um, the clerk set up for me and that i work with um, as i manage the public forum it looks like we got bunch of counselors coming back on. So we'll get to that public forum once we get all the other counselors on. Okay, yep, seeing a ton jump on now. This is great. Apologize for getting back a little bit after our 7.30 um, public forum start. We had some questions, um, some conversation in executive session that went a little long. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven,
don't see counselors Paul or Shannon on yet. Or Shannon's in the attendees. Okay, I will promote Councillor Shannon. Oh. And we have Councillor Paul now. Excellent. Okay. So we will go right into our public forum, um, which as I said, the way you sign up is just going to burlingtonbt.gov slash city council, one word, slash public forum. And then there's a, a fillable form that you just sign up with um, on there. Um, our usual practice is to prioritize um, people of color, uh, as well as Burlington residents um, in our public forum. Um, and this evening we will be having public forum. It's a time certain from 7.30 to 9.30, um, though I don't think we have too many folks signed up for tonight, this evening's public forum, so we may very well um, end uh, much sooner than that. Um, if the city clerk could please get the timer up um, just so that we can get the, um, public forum going. I'll look, I'm looking for our, our first speaker. Okay, so our first speaker um, is, who signed up is Dan Cunningham. Dan, I was not able to locate you um, in the um, in the chat. Uh, I mean, in, in the attendees list. Um, maybe you've used the raised hand function. Okay, one day in July advisor. I think that's you. So I'm going to enable you to speak, Dan. Hopefully, this is you. Um, you should be you should be able to speak now. Hi, it's me. Hi, Max. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dan. Can everyone hear me? Yep, go ahead. Uh, my name is Dan Cunningham, and I'm here tonight to ask the City Council to engage in the movement to reopen Burlington High School without the F building. Um, the high school was shut down not based on a law or even a regulation, but on an arbitrary screening threshold that was defined in a memo. Uh, yes, you heard that right, a memo. Uh, Vermont's threshold for immediate closure of a school is 200 times lower than that of the Europeans. There is no material medical risk from PCBs in buildings A through E, even after 30 years of exposure. You can see the details on openbhs.com. I'm here tonight because this action is one of the most inequitable I've ever seen in the state of Vermont. Almost a thousand kids have no high school it's terrible for all of them, but for many of them, this is the only formal education they will ever have. And BHS serves as their social structure as well. This burden falls disproportionately on people of color and those with fewer resources. It's a major issue. Our local community is in agreement this time, but we need your help as city councilors to convince the state to be reasonable to join with the rest of the world scientific community and revise their guidance so BHS has a chance to open. Again, this is one of the most unjust, inequitable decisions I've ever seen in Vermont, and it's imposed by our state itself. The parents of Open BHS ask for your help as city councilors to stop it as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Nathan Larkin. Nathan, I'm enabling your microphone. Should be able to speak now. Hi, yes, uh, this is Nathan Larkin. I just wanna thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I would like to express my support for allowing small outdoor fires in Burlington. Uh, I feel that the 
uh, that during these times, it's important to provide alternatives to indoor gathering and facilitate socialization. Uh, having personally experienced the use of smokeless fires at other family members' residences, I can personally vouch for their effectiveness. Uh, my clothes and, and so forth don't even smell the next morning after sitting next to a fire for an extended period of time. So given that, I would imagine that this would be a great compromise so that taxpaying citizens can enjoy their backyards and the health needs of others can be appreciated. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I believe that was the only other person that I had in the signups for public forum um, for this evening. So I'm gonna go ahead and close the public forum um, for tonight and we will, um, if you could please take down the timer. We'll now go into um, our the rest of our agenda. Item number four is the climate emergency reports. Does anyone have a climate emergency report that they'd like to offer this evening? Okay, seeing none, we'll keep moving. Um, we'll go right on to item number five, which is our consent agenda. Councilor Stromberg, may I please have a motion on the consent agenda? I move to adopt the consent agenda and take the actions indicated. Thank you for the motion. Is there a second to that motion on the consent agenda? Seconded by Councillor Pine. Any discussion? Okay, hearing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, that passes unanimously. We'll now move um, into our um, deliberative agenda. I will, we do have a number of other meetings, um, but I would like to just make sure in, in recognition of the fact that we have um, some of our colleagues um, from the school district, both Chair Wool yeah. and Superintendent Flanagan, I'd like to get to them um, sooner rather than later. I see both of them have joined us. So um, I'm going to go to item 6.01 first, and then after that, we'll start to get into the other recess meetings before coming back into the rest of our deliberative agenda, just in, in order to um, get to that update um, and not keep them waiting uh, on that issue. So um, I appreciate um, Superintendent Flanagan, you being here as well as Chair Wool um, and all your work um, to facilitate um, what has been uh, likely the most challenging school year that either of you have had to deal with in your tenure. So very much appreciate you um, and all your work there. And then also just for being willing amidst that to come and share updates with us as a council um, on that work, because um, it is um, really helpful for us to continue to keep those lines of communication open. So just wanna very much appreciate you being here this evening. And I understand you have a, a short presentation to share with us. So um, I'll turn <coughs> it over to both of you to, to give us that update. Thanks again. Great, thank you so much for having us. Uh, and yeah, like I said, I uh, have a presentation to share, so I put right now. Can everyone see? Um, so, is everyone able to see this? Okay. All right, great. Um, so, yeah, tonight we're, uh, Chair Wool and, and I are here. Uh, I'll um, walk through this presentation with you all here, and then we will both be able for any questions and conversations. Uh, Chair Wool, do you want to say any opening words? No, just very appreciative. Uh, uh, Councilor Paul had reached out to me and uh, Council President, just very appreciative for this timely um, opportunity to speak to you as we will be having a school board meeting tomorrow night as a follow-up to our school board meeting last Tuesday uh, to discuss specifically uh, BHS and BTC campus. So thank you very, very much for affording us this time on your agenda. Great. Uh, so uh, what we'll do is, is break this into three general areas. So the first is an update on current and expanded in-person learning, primarily focused on BAS tonight. BTC has moved into some in-person spaces and is moving into some in-person spaces. That's closer. Uh, but um, the majority of the conversation tonight is focused on 
uh, Burlington High School. So, uh, and then um, update on the B BHS BTC site uh, after we talk about sort of the current state and, and immediate plans, and then uh, review with you our, our, what we see right now is three kind of, of our, our uh, clear options. So we are offering a lot of in-person and a lot of contact with students currently, um, but uh, we also know that the in-person in learning uh, is really important for students and, and they are, they're not getting enough of that right now. So, uh, but I wanted to just give you a sense of, of what, is, what is happening. So uh, we have a lot of academic programming and social emotional support happening. And we have a lot of students who are taking advantage of, of in-person activities. I would say sports and the, the athletics have, have really been uh, an amazing way uh, for, the, for the community to stay connected. I had the opportunity to see a game this Saturday, last Saturday night, and uh, it's just great to see students out and uh, playing on the fields and, and in the stands cheering their, their classmates on. So that's been a really important part of the community this fall. We also uh, have are, are in full day, uh, in a full day, a full course load uh, of remote learning for, for students at the high school. Uh, Principal Green is giving daily information. He's got some exciting uh, videos that he's posted with some trivia and some engaging ways to get students information uh, and also be able to see him face to face. Uh, we have a lot of counseling happening, a lot of uh, from our guidance counselors and social workers and outreach uh, that's happening on an individual basis. We've got virtual college tours happening every day, multiple colleges coming in and school counselors working with individual students. Uh, like I said, with the, we have about 275 students participating in fall sports, all those in person. Uh, so you see a lot of activity out on the fields at the, at the, in the afternoons. Uh, about 100 students participating in in-person music and other activities weekly. Uh, we are offering some PE classes. Uh, we do also have 15 students in in-person learning with Burlington City and Lake. Uh, that program is, is running and they're, they're doing some great work there. Uh, we do have nine students in a, who are English learners who are in a class at Edmonds Middle School uh, currently. And 15 students from our program for students with intensive special needs, that's the ISN acronym there um, at different locations. I've also been meeting with students. Uh, I've met with students three times so far, a small student group, uh, to hear their feedback on, on what we can improve in this, in this posture that we're in. Uh, and they're really giving us good ideas about centralizing communication. So they're getting lots and lots of emails and they are uh, wanting to centralize those and, and deal with um, help us better communicate uh, to, to them in this, in this new world. Um, we also know that we need to expand in-person learning for BHS students. And so we are beginning our plans. We've been planning and, and getting ready to uh, offer in-person options for students. Um, we had to really shift gears because when we moved to remote learning so quickly, it took a, it took a couple of days to get situated. Um, and then, it, and then it takes time to get used to uh, teaching in a remote, in a remote setting and, and, set, and setting a new schedule. And so there was a lot of work that went into those first couple of weeks of getting, in, in person, getting into remote learning. But we also know that our students need in-person options. And we've been hearing from the community loud and clear that uh, the families of BHS that we need to get in person as soon as possible. Um, and so we are um, beginning plans. So I've, I've reassigned two staff members, uh, 2.25 partial of a, of a third staff member uh, to support the BH leadership in this work that they've already started to begin to offer in-person learning. So we're, we're gonna be looking at other buildings um, in, this, in, in our uh, portfolio of, of currently opened buildings and offering um, programming in, in those buildings. But that team's gonna be working with staff and, and working out what, what that exactly could look like. Uh, but we're, we are aiming for a mid-November timeframe there. Uh, we're also going to be surveying families and students uh, and staff to under underneath their perspective. Um, kind of shift over to the to the PCB um, testing. Uh, I just want to kind of take us back a little bit. So the PCB um, testing results uh, that we received in September were below the EPA screening levels, uh, but they were above the de department Department of Health. Um, 
uh, screening level. So in September 2020, we learned that the BHS BTC campus had these PCBs uh, in the air that were significantly above the Department of Health screening value uh, of 15 nanograms per cubic meter. Um, we at that point when we first got the tests back, those were we we received building F first. Uh, and test some of the rooms in, in building F were at 6,000 uh, or higher. Uh, so that was when we originally decided we had to close the entire building. Um, but then we received the results back in, in buildings A through E, and those buildings came back in you know, around 200, 300 nanograms per cubic meter, and all the tests in buildings A through E were below the EPA screening level of 500 to 600 nanograms per cubic meter. Uh, but after that, we reviewed those results with the Department of Health and the EPA and our consultants, um, and both agencies explained that the screening level is not a hard line, but it's a line at which you need to do further investigation. Um, and so that, that um, after learning that, um, we, consult, we, in that consultation uh, with the Department of Health and the EPA, they recommended that students not return to the building until further testing and remediation was conducted. Now that's ultimately a district decision, so we, we made that decision, uh, but it was clear that it was, a, it was a recommendation from also the, our, uh, the, the entire team, including the Department of Health and the EPA. Um, and so considering the, that recommendation, we moved right away to remote learning. Uh, we decided to continue to test and remediate at the site, so we wanted to better understand the, the what happening at the site and what was creating PCBs, materials that were creating PCDs or the conditions that were creating PCBs in the air uh, so that we could remediate. So we're doing remote learning then we're testing and remediating. And we started really aggressively seeking alternative sites for in-person instruction. Uh, and I said, I stated as the goal that, that, that we would be, uh, our goal would be to be in person for second semester in January. Um, and then we also are continuing the planning with the uh, re-envisioning project for BTC and BHS. So that's a, lot, that's a project that has been going on for a couple of years now, and there's been progress in that project. And, uh, and so that project continues. So those BCOC meetings, the, the meetings uh, of the committee that is working on this and uh, are continuing, and the work is continuing in that over re-envisioning project. Um, so well, on, the, on the piloting side of the world, um, we have a consultant. They have begun a pilot project to test the air in the buildings to determine the possibility of remediation uh, of the PCBs. So that's, a, that's not a simple and straightforward process. And the current projected timeline for us to complete that pilot project would be to end in March of 21. And we knew right away that this timeline for the testing and remediation was going to be months. And so that was probably what led to our decision to move into the remote posture and to start looking for alternative sites. Um, we've also identified an alternative site uh, for BHS. We looked at every possible site you could imagine uh, in and around Burlington. We did find that we have identified a site that, that, um, uh, that we think is very promising. We reviewed the space to ensure it can house a school. We've completed drawings to envision the, the layout of the space. And we've started working with the owners to better understand the cost. So that is actively moving. Um, and then um, in general, we know that we, we have a, a challenging uh, decision to make and we're in a challenging situation. Uh, we know that remote learning is not great for any students, um, and we, we know that isolation is having a negative effect on, on students' uh, mental well-being. That's both in, in Burlington, but we also kind of hear and see this across the country, but we're definitely hearing this clearly from our families uh, and from our students that we need to really be paying attention to the, the, the health and well-being of our, the, the, social, the social emotional health and well-being of our students. Um, we've also heard the considerable advocacy from BHS families to return to buildings A through E. We, uh, Chair Wool and I have met with, with a group of families. The uh, families are, are uh, advocating and pushing and, and really wanting to get back into to school as soon as possible. And, 
and I understand that and, and empathize with them and, and also want to do everything I can to get back um, into a building as soon as possible. Um, so that, that uh, there are parents who are questioning the possibility uh, of physical health concerns um, against the, do, do those outweigh the mental health concerns, right? So there's a question about w w the weight there uh, and what we should be prioritizing. Uh, but we also know, and we also know that our labor partners, uh, the BEA and AFSCME, um, are, are not in support of, of returning to, to BHS without further testing and, and remediation. So all this leads to a kind of a stew of, of really complicated uh, decision-making process that we're gonna need to, uh, that we're currently in and we'll, we'll need to continue to engage in with our board um, and also look forward to the partnership with city council and, and, and the mayor has been very supportive as well. Um, so we're quickly approaching uh, this important decision. These are the three options that, that I'll be presenting to the board uh, tomorrow for them to deliberate on. Um, the first is we return to BHS while remediation occurs and the reinvent project continues as planned. So this is like an immediate return back to the, back to the school building. The second option is to move to an alternate location for two to three years while remediation and re-envisioning occurs at the BHS site, um, and then to move back into that BHS site after the construction. So we move to an alternation, we continue along with the construction process that we've, that we've already we've begun, and, um, and move back when that process is complete. And then the third is that we move to an alternate location for two to three years while building a new high school and tech center at our current site or in a new location. Uh, so this one is different than, than this than re-envisioning. This construction would be different than the current re-envisioning plan. So tomorrow night, the board is going to be deliber deliberating on, on these three options. I'm basically doing the same presentation that we covered at the beginning that I covered with you. And then I have some more detail that I'll be covering with them uh, around those, those three options. So we're encouraging you know, people to join us tomorrow uh, at 6 p.m. on Zoom, and public comment will be at, at 6.10. So at that point, we're, we're open for questions. Or if, or Cheryl, if you want to add anything to. Yeah, the only thing uh, that we, we didn't share, because right now we are immediately uh, concerned with BHS. We, over the last uh, six weeks, completely moved a uh, Burlington Tech Center, as well as our on top uh, high school program and our um, uh, tech center on top and our ISN. Yep. So we, we moved our Burlington Technical Center, which houses 228 students currently from ascending schools to uh, locations throughout the city of Burlington. That was a huge feat for us uh, and Superintendent Flanagan and his staff. And we were very fortunate with a lot of community partners to secure space for the technical center. Um, we also are on top again, uh, we were able to find space. So we have been incredibly busy and it wasn't a priority. It was just based on numbers and where we could get those two uh, schools, uh, program and schools, uh, technical center set up. And so by the end of this month, those, all of them uh, will be in in-person learning. So now it begs the question of our only high school uh, with roughly 970 students plus faculty and staff, where can we return to in-person learning? And so our communication to you tonight is to let you know that we do feel an absolute sense of urgency since the closing. It has been on our, uh, you know, you know, 24 seven, all hands on deck, but we were managing these two other entities on this campus of which we, again, sorry to be long winded, this, these scenarios do not even discuss our technical center of which we know that building, F building has the highest concern. So we'll have to come back to you and to our, our, our school district and community to discuss separately the future of the technical center because our re-envisioning our $70 million bond was not 
being um, directed, there were there were improvements to that F building, but that building had had improvements earlier over the course of the last eight years. So there were um, some ADA accessibility items and some uh, lavatory and some HVAC, but the bulk of our bond was going to the BHS uh, proper property based on uh, budget. So I just don't want you to think that after this presentation, we have ignored BTC and that'll, that'll be another whole conversation, but because they're successfully up and running, we have to address that as a school district, Burlington Technical Center. But our priority right now, because we have successfully worked through that programming for this school year is BHS, to bring to your attention where we are at BHS. Excellent. Thank you very much for the, that presentation. I see Councillor Jang. Go ahead, Councillor. Councillor Jang, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Tom, and also Claire for Chair Claire for being here. It was not clear to me in your presentation about the recommendation from the Department of Health and the decision that was made to close the school and move students in a um, remote learning. Can you clarify that aspect again? Uh, was it your decision and the recommendation you received from the Department of Health, did it say you have to close the school or did it give you a legal room and you made the decision to close the, the building A and E? So the, 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 yes, thank you. So, so the decision was the decision. However, we, sure we received the recommendation from the Department of Health and the Environmental Protection Agency. So going into that conversation, we knew there was a difference between that is the screening threshold, uh, the screening level for the Department of Health and the 500 to 600 grams per cubic, the Vermont, which is PPA uh, screen. So when those tests came back from building A through EPA numbers, we did, cons we did think, okay, there's a, there's a possibility of us getting back in there. At least I did. Um, but then we right away had a call and we had the EPA on the call and the EPA reinforced for us that their number is not a number. These are not hard lines that they told us. Um, these are, their numbers are screening levels at which you have to learn more about the, the, the airborne PCBs. And, and their rec they did not recommend they were us to go back in. Their recommendation was for us to do more testing and remediation. So when we heard from the Department of Health and the EPA that, that, that the recommendation was not to go back, we did ultimately have a decision that we had to make. The decision seemed very clear because there was no one telling us a safe return. And their, their experts, you know, were, were uh, elected officials and, and education experts, um, but not toxicologists. Yep, um, thank you. And I think uh, the other question is specific to, um, it seems you found an alternative location where students can be housed and you choose to not share exactly that physical location, but was just one, you have your reason and I respect it. And was just wondering what are the costs associated in bringing that location to, to, to code in order to house students? Do we, and also where, that money will be coming from, knowing you know you only have a yearly budget for to run the school district. Right. So the the building because because we're still in negotiations or we're we're going to be entering into negotiations around the building. Um, it's just not prudent for us to share too many details on that right now. Understand. And in and because we're in that situation, we don't really have. Uh, a, 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 a number 
uh, to give that's very precise. So we do know that we could fit up the building um, to be able to be used and that that would be uh, millions of dollars. So probably in the three, in the, in the three million dollar range to get, um, to get the, the site ready. And then there's a question of rent. So what would rent be uh, on top of that? And so, you know, we have a number of different, of different ways that we could work to achieve that. Um, but it is, it is uh, unbudgeted right now. And so it's, a, it's something we really have to, to think hard about and, and to, to figure out how we would do that uh, in the most responsible way. Um, I will say that, you know, many districts have swing spaces uh, and, and districts that don't have swing spaces will put up trailers and house, house classes, parts of schools, so forth and trailers and those are costly too. So while it's unbudgeted, it's not unheard of to need a swing space and to need to factor that into the overall cost of a, of a project. Wonderful. But this just was not a part of our plan, you know? Yeah, wonderful. Um, and here's a last question. And if he's an idea, maybe you want to explore it or not. Knowing that Wednesdays, all schools are closed. How about closing two days a week, elementary and middle school and house um, high school and BTC in, in, in the regular schools? That way will save a lot of money. Uh, but maybe you want to explore that and see if it's feasible. Yes, and we are looking at using our schools uh, on, so I hear you, this is not the same thing, but we are, we are looking at using our, uh, some of our schools on those Wednesdays because there are no students in school on yeah. Wednesday currently, uh, or not, not, very few. And so that, uh, that is definitely in the works. Mm -hmm. And if we can't find another site and there's, there, you know, we run, in, run into a wall there, then we will have to start looking at how we utilize all of our portfolio to get more in-person learning for our high school students. So that's something that I appreciate the idea. I think it's a good one and, and something that we may need to consider. Wonderful. I mean, it's just at the cost here right now and everything that's going on. I'm sure the 70 millions you will need more and it's, it's important to be strategic and uh, utilize whatever we have. But thank yeah. you for being here and all that you do. Thank you. Yeah, and I think there's a long-term uh, advocacy sort of battle the fight, which has which was started. Uh, Chair Wool and and many others uh, started this this push with the legislature last spring around the weighted funding formula. So we have an inequitable weighted funding or inequitable funding formula in in Vermont, and and everyone knows it. Uh, and so the legislature was picking it up last spring, but COVID hit. Uh, that that is something that we are going to need long term. Uh, to support the district, it'll help, but it's something we need long term uh, for the district. And there are many other districts in in the Northeast Kingdom and sort of more rural areas and Winooski, other areas that that um, are not being uh, that the funding formula is not working for. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Chang. I have Councilor Mason to be followed by Councilor Paul. Go ahead, Councilor Mason. Uh, thank you, President Tracy. Um, Thank you, Superintendent Flanagan and Chairperson Wolf for that uh, sobering, I will say, update. My first question really relates to one of timing. Um, and I'm not, I, I can only imagine what your decision tree looks like as you're trying to map out strategy. You, you talked about uh, the meeting tomorrow and, and you know the three options. As I was looking at the three options, there are so many variables in those three options. I, I don't fully understand how you can make a meaningful decision. I mean, option three of a new high school, we don't know the, you know, no idea what that cost is. As you were weighing option one, you know, going back in, I saw an earlier data point that the testing won't be done until March. And, you know, the, the unions were emphatic about not going in until the testing was done. So I'm trying to figure out what is your, you know, what is your decision process or when are you envisioning picking one of the options and sort of moving forward um, on that. Because I know the goal is to get the kids back in the school second semester. I, I'm, I'm skeptical, let's just put it that way, so. 
Yeah. So the um, the decision making. So first, I want to make sure I was clear because I don't think I was in the beginning. We're not actually making a decision tomorrow night. Tomorrow night is informational. We need more information. And so one of the last slides is is going to be a, about the information that the board will need to make to make the decision uh, to make an informed decision. And then Chair Wallet, sorry, that was probably your answer. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, Councillor Mason. This is what we're struggling with. We have a time frame that you know we are separate from the actual physical building. Uh, we want the messaging to be clear to our BHS families that there will be in-person learning, um, you know, mid-November, and that we are hoping if we cannot find a singular location um, to. Uh, you know, that we will work within our own properties and, and somehow manage uh, between the middle schools. Uh, but there are, like you saw, you know, the unions are not looking uh, to go back into BHS unless they get the Department of Health and EPA or Department of Health approval or endorsement. Um, and the testing of which we have just found out from receiving the pilot overview um, and having to go out to um, bid would be by March, um, but we wanted to be able to share and have this exact dialogue with the board so people become more educated on or how we're, if we just delivered what we think is the next, there wouldn't be the opportunity to ask questions. So um, by posing it in that format is to say, well, this is the ideal going back into BHS, but here's our, here's our roadblock. We, we cannot go back to school if we don't have the unions behind us. Um, and then if we do, you know, go forward with an alternative location, there's an expense and how do we amortize it over the course of the, of the time there, but we can also uh, fast track, and I don't want that that's sort of cliche, we could potentially save dollars by renovating the high school without students there. Um, it wouldn't take as long in the process of, of the original re-envisioning timeline. And then the feedback that we are getting as elected officials, as you might be, is from citizens saying, what if that site is, you know, not, we can't mitigate the issues on that site. And so we wanted to put it out there that that is the feedback we've been receiving from people so that if in fact it's, we can't mitigate things out of that site, what do we do? Um, and what do we explore? But those things would have to be answered after we do the pilot program. So we're, we're certainly hearing from some of the same constituents, you know, who are, I would say, hitting all the, you know, all the concerns you're raising from, we need to get the kids back in now to, we have no idea, you know, what the health issues are. I guess, as you're sort of working through what additional information, one of the biggest, and, and I have a personal stake, I have a, a child who's in the school is sort of, you know, the unknown on timing. And, and I know that's a struggle, but if there is some ability to provide that, I think in this pandemic, you know, it's sort of the uncertainty of when this ends. And this is sort of the same thing, you know, where, when are you hoping to make a decision one way or the other, or at least commit to a course um, and then trying to, you know, to stick to that. And I, I'll just say the other piece personally as well, if there are ways um, not to put this all on you, but if there are ways that we as a council, you know, can advocate whether it's for state funding or to those who are licensing, um, I would encourage you. I think we're we're stronger working together. Um, but I don't know. You know, right now we don't really know where to push or what to do. So, going forward, as that plan comes into fruition, please, you know, continue to reach out and and utilize us as well. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank well, you, Councillor Mason. I have Councillor Paul to be followed by Councillor Pine. Go ahead, Councillor Paul. Thank you very much, President Tracy. Um, Superintendent Flanagan, thanks so much for taking the time to be here with us. Um, and of course, to Chair Wall, yes, you are in Ward 6. I have to put a plug in for you. Um, the, um, uh, the first question, or actually the one, I, one thing I would appreciate is um, uh, if you could make the PowerPoint that you just showed us available, um, if you could give that to, to us so that we can post that, that would be helpful. Um, uh, along with the information about the school board meeting um, tomorrow night. Um, and uh, Councillor uh, Mason, 
uh, pretty much addressed a lot of the things that I was going to mention. Um, it does seem as though, um, you know, we such a long process went, we went through such a long process to get to re-envisioning and then um, found out that that was, you know, a lot of what we really loved about the vision isn't something that we can really afford. Um, so it would seem as though 70 million to do a renovation, granted renovations can sometimes be more expensive than, than building from the ground. But it seems as though um, to then start a whole new process of going through and starting basically a new high school, um, and unless you're able to get money from somewhere to be able to do the remediation, it, it seems, I mean, it just seems as, I think as Councilor uh, Mason said, it seems like there's a lot of questions. Um, the, the only thing that I would uh, just simply mention, and it's just simply a suggestion, is that the number of parents that I've heard from, which is why I contacted um, uh, school board chair, uh, Claire Wool, was because of the fact that um, people feel very in the dark. Um, they feel like they're not getting enough information. And, you know, we know as elected officials that, you know, sometimes when people say that they really are getting a lot of information. Um, sometimes it's very difficult to give people all the information that they want, you know, it's a, it's a constant challenge. And um, so my suggestion would just simply be that going forward, um, you know, more information is always better than less. Um, uh, that, you know, you just be as upfront as you possibly can, maybe even checking in with people on a weekly basis. Um, and also that, you um, uh, perhaps in some way that you break down the 900 or so students um, into smaller groups so that parents and, and students would have opportunities on Zoom with perhaps the two of you or others um, to give their input and allow them time for questions. Um, you know, I think the town hall, it, it was a good start, but, you know, for some people, it's, it's difficult to be able to ask the questions that they want um, and obviously there's only so many hours in a day, you can't speak with every parent every day individually. Um, so that would be my suggestion because we are, I know for myself, I mean, I have gotten a number of, of calls, emails, et cetera, from people who have, are very concerned that they are going to be looking at another semester um, without full in-person learning. So Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Councilor Paul. The, I have sent um, the, the the PowerPoint to all the city council and then also to the clerk's office and asked that it be posted to board docs. So um, we should have that up there and you all should have that in your inbox right now. So for your review. Um, Thanks. I have uh, Councilor Pine to be followed by Councilor Hansen. Go ahead, Councilor Pine. Thanks, Mr. President. The um, question I have, Chair Wool and Superintendent Flanagan, is um, I have some background um, and familiarity with environmental health and standards that the EPA um, issues. And in this case, I've been, I've been really kind of baffled uh, by the screening level, it's called, that the health department uses. And I want to know how much you've dug into that and whether that is an approach that is universal in, in public health or if it's unique to our health department, because it seems as though we are stuck with a sort of order from the state that is, um, shall we say, not necessarily shared by others in, um, in the public health um, profession. So I just wanna know how much of you pushed into this a little bit, leaned into it a little bit to try and assess whether we are an outlier in that regard. Well, we, we've worked hard to understand it. I mean, the there's definitely a difference, you know, the difference in screening levels between the Department of Health and the EPA is, is, is you know, a lot of nanograms per cubic meter, uh, 15 to, to between 15 for the Vermont Department of Health and 500 to 600 for the EPA. So we have dug in, we have, we have been working to understand, understand this. We've been We've been listening. Uh, I, I, I hear uh, Councillor Paul's ask and push for, for more communication. So I, I hear that and I take that and 
that seriously. Uh, we've been really trying to communicate, but uh, I can, we, can do, we can do more, we can do better. Um, so we have been working to understand those, those levels. Um, and, and like I said earlier, when, I, when we received the A through E uh, numbers back, I thought that we were gonna be able to come back. That was my, that was my instinct. Um, because we, were, we seemed well within the EPA uh, standard, but the Vermont standard is more, is, I don't know if more rigorous is the right word, but it's, you know, it's 15 nanograms per cubic meter, and, and um, that's the screening level. Again, it's not a hard line, and so um, they were clear with us on, on that as well. But when we heard from the EPA and the Department of Health together, um, that, that, that made the decision for us. Okay. And also, I would add, thank you, um, Councillor Pine, for that question. Um, one, uh, hiring our environmental firm, ATC, uh, for the beginning of this project since its inception, uh, as well as then bringing on a, another um, PCB, um, uh, Fuss and O'Neill, um, we, we did... The minute all this news came to us and, and we sat in meetings with these A state agencies and their advisement, um, you know, figuring out, you know, what next and reaching out to the environmental, uh, Vermont Environmental Consortium. A lot of BHS uh, families, um, you know, ask this question. Are we have incredibly involved and dedicated parents, um, one who spoke tonight, uh, have dedicated numerous, you know, multiple um, weeks now trying to figure out uh, this, the piece of the, getting familiar with all everything PCBs. Um, and so the research that they have done and, you know, how we have interpreted this is we, we see the value in asking throughout the state, um, you know, and, and misery loves company, company, finding out of other school districts, we did find out one in Worcester and, you know, how our state is, uh, looking at this information in PCBs and how, um, you know, at what point do we push back and do we ask them, uh, you know, because the town hall that we hosted with them was incredibly intimidating and we didn't feel it was um, level to the degree of, of the concerns uh, that many of us felt after, it's not necessarily fear mongering, but that, you know, that was, uh, you know, that was their interpretation of it. And that was, we, we have to respect them as state agencies, but now let's look throughout New England or throughout this country, how, how what those levels are and, and how would they impact other school, uh, schools or, or, or buildings. Um, so, you know, I welcome, I'll, after this, I will follow up with you um, because we are, I believe we have a tremendous amount of support from our citizens who are asking, uh, for more clarity on that. Um, they're not asking necessarily like change your stance, Dr. Levine or toxicologist Sarah Bowes, but explain to us how we would be able to, um, you know, justify this, this, this number, this 15, when it, it seems like it's not tenable, like that we would never be able to get to that uh, number or throughout the country, we've been told that it's just the lowest that it, it possibly could be. So, um, you know, we are, we did ask those questions and we are actively, you know, pursuing that. But when we hear from, you know, we're also coming off a pandemic of which our health department has received incredible accolades and we know that we've benefited from their guidance. So there was not a, we were not in a position um, and I know, uh, you know, Superintendent Flanagan and I asked many times are, you know, is this, are you telling us that, you're advising us, uh, and it, they were very firm with us. Um, and so, you know, again, we value their their work and their judgment, and we believe now we have communicated back to them over the last two weeks with pushback to ask, you know, these statistics of of harm that this these levels could cause. Um, against the emotional that it was ignored. The mental well-being of students not being in school was not on their slide deck during the time hall, town hall and it really did not sit well with citizens of Burlington. Sure, because 50, 50 years of students have gone through that building. Mm -hmm. So um, 
as the father of two sons, I did a little bit of research to assure them that they weren't at risk. And what I found was the amount of time they would have had to spend right up next to that window glazing for their entire childhood and throughout was like, you know, every day, 10 hours a day, 20 hours a day. It was ridiculous. It would have been like impossible to do and still eat your lunch and mingle with your friends and go to sports and everything else. So anyway, it just struck me as sometimes I just worry about overkill. And I feel like this is, this is an example of that. So. Yeah. Thank you. We did, again, we're very, very lucky. I mean, I feel we all know as, as civic leaders or, or, you know, elected officials or engaged community, but the minute this happens, you know, we have lawyers, you know, that have dealt with the state and urban soils uh, and they are BHS parents and the BHS parents that reached out to us or spoke to CAX who are, you know, in this field and, and have pushed back on the state's, um, you know, recommendation to us. So I feel as if we are in good company, but it is, it will take time and legislation. And that's really what we've been told uh, by the Department of Health that, you know, last year the legislation passed about lead drinking water in all schools. And now, you know, here we are, it's the, you know, we are very lucky our taxpayers afforded us a $70 million bond to do renovation work for buildings that are not ADA accessible or efficient or safe. Uh, and so look at what we did. We followed a timeline. We did our environmental testing to get us to the next phase of, of permitting and construction. And now we're faced with this situation. Um, but this you know, this is uh, with a state that offers no construction aid. So my laundry, you know, I could talk to you all very long and at length that it's, you know, it's a troubling situation to be in. And I feel like I've shared publicly, it's not a Burlington problem, uh, but, you know, to not have any outreach from uh, the state on the mental wellness of our students of not being in school uh, at this time uh, and helping us uh, identify how, you know, to move forward is concerning, you know, to us for sure and frustrating. But so Councilor Pine, thank you for recognizing that and, and doing the research yourself to see what the risks are. Hey, I have Councilor Hansen in the queue. Go ahead, Councilor. Great, thank you both so much for, for being here and, and for all your hard work on, on all of this. And thanks for kind of your focus on trying to get get students back for in-person learning in, in one way or another. Um, I think the member of the public who called in was spot on with um, the equity implications of, of remote learning. And, and so I, I think I'm really glad to see that you're working hard on that. Um, something a little bit um, unrelated to what we've heard so far, but I just, I think it's something that's easy to lose and that we should all remind ourselves of both the council and the administration and the school board. We did, we did pass um, a climate emergency resolution last September. And one of the items on that that I wanna make sure that we're not losing collectively, because um, I think it's easy to with everything going on, um, is that we did include in that resolution that um, city commissions would include in their annual updates to the council, um, updates on progress towards addressing the climate crisis. So I know we're dealing with several crises at once here and it's, it's difficult. Um, so definitely not, not a criticism whatsoever, but um, just a reminder um, for us and for the administration um, that, you know, we're, we still are going to need to keep that laser focus and just to make sure that, um, our presenters in, from commissions going forward are, are reminded of that and made aware of that. Um, Cause I'd love to hear, I know you all are doing a lot um, at, um, in the school district to, to address the climate crisis. So um, at some point, you know, would love to, to hear about that as well. Absolutely. We will get on your calendar. <laughs> Sounds great. I appreciate it. Hey, that's the only other counselor I had in the queue. Anyone else with questions? 
Okay, seeing none, um, we will move on to our next item. I just want to thank both Chair Wool and Superintendent Flanagan for being here and sharing these updates with us. And again, folks, uh, there is a school board meeting tomorrow evening um, to provide further details on that. Uh, Chair Wool, did you just want to provide that um, timing again for folks and how they can access that meeting? Yep, it's on our Burlington School District website as well under board docs and it's a six o'clock start of meeting. Yep, and Zoom information is on there. Excellent, well, thanks again, very much appreciate it um, and all the work that you're doing to, to help our students across the district. Um, with that, we'll move um, into back into our deliberative agenda. Um, we do have a number of other meetings. So point of information. Yep. Looks like okay. the mayor would like to say something. Oh, okay. I apologize, Mayor Weinberger. Go ahead. Um, thank you, President Tricia. Thank you, Councilor Chang. I just briefly wanted to um, say to the council and the public that um, the administration uh, is uh, very engaged with the school district on a whole range of issues related to the pandemic and, and this high school issue. We have a emergency opera. We continue to have an emergency operations call every Friday with the department head team, which the school district participates in. And uh, we um, get, uh, coordinate regarding the pandemic and, uh, and check in uh, on the high school situation on a weekly basis. Uh, and I've given the direction to my team to um, be supportive in any way as we can um, as, the, as the district is um, grappling with this very challenging situation with the high school. And uh, we're, we're gonna continue to uh, try to provide that support uh, going forward. And uh, just want the council of the public to be clear on that. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for providing that um, additional context, Mayor. Um, now we'll move on to some of the other items uh, on our deliberative agenda, but um, for members of the public, we do also have um, other meeting structures, um, I guess it would be a way to describe it, um, in which we, we also meet outside of the regular city council meeting. Um, there are decisions that are still made by the city council and in two cases this evening that also include the mayor presiding. Um, we're gonna go into those structures now. Um, so we have next, we'll have the local control commission, committee meeting um, to be followed by the board of civil authority, which deals with voting issues um, and electoral issues. And then um, the city council with mayor presiding for a couple of appointments. So give folks a chance to just switch over to those meetings. Um, they're on board docs. Um, there is um, are a number of items. So we'll go to local control first, as I said before. Um, so once folks are over there, I'll come to Councillor Hansen for a motion on that agenda. Is everybody able to get navigate over? Okay. Seeing nods, uh, Councillor Hanson, may I please have a motion on the agenda? Yeah, I'll move to adopt the agenda. Okay, we have a motion seconded by Councillor Stromberg. Um, any discussion on our agenda on the Local Control Commission? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that passes unanimously. And we'll now move into our deliberative agenda on the local control committee. Uh, local control committee committee um, that uh, brings us to item two point oh one. May I have a motion on that, please, Councillor Hanson? Yeah, I'll move to approve the 2020 2021 second class liquor license application for Black Cap Coffee and Beer, forty two Church Street, with the following conditions: all city permits need to be closed closed out with all standard conditions. Excellent. Seconded by Councillor Stromberg. Any discussion on this item? Okay, hearing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that passes unanimously. It brings us to 2.02. .02. Councillor Hansen may have a motion on that. I'll move to approve the 2020 2021 second class liquor license application for NJ Beverages LLC, 500 Riverside Avenue, with the following conditions complete record checks with all standard conditions. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second from Councillor Stromberg? Any discussion on this? Okay, hearing none, um, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. We'll now move on to item 2.03. May I please have a motion, Councillor Hansen? Move to approve the 2020 2021 
second class liquor license application for Poppy Cafe and Market, 88 Oak Street with the following conditions. All city permits need to be closed out with all standard conditions. Okay, we have a motion, is there a second? Seconded by Councilor Freeman. Any discussion of this? Okay, you see hearing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that passes unanimously. Um, that brings us to our next item. Will you please give us a motion, Councilor Hansen? Move to approve the 2020-2021 first and third class restaurant slash bar liquor license applications for Cafe Mama Juana, 88 Oak Street with the following conditions. Complete record checks contingent upon fire marshal approval. All city permits need to be co closed out with all standard conditions. Thank you, Councilor Hansen. Uh, we have a motion. Is there a second seconded from Councilor Freeman? Any discussion on this item? Hearing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that passes unanimously. Um, it brings us to, I believe, our final item, uh, 2.05 on the um, deliberative agenda. May I please have a motion, Councilor Hansen. Yes, I'll move to approve the 2020 and 2021 outside consumption permit application for Cafe Mama Juana, 88 Oak Street, with the following conditions complete record checks, and all city permits need to be closed out. Okay, we have a motion. Uh, there's a second from Councillor Freeman. Uh, any further discussion on this? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, that passes unanimously. A motion to adjourn is now in order. So moved. Moved by Councillor Hansen. Is there a second? Seconded by Councillor Stromberg. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. aye. The local control committee is now, commission is now um, adjourned at 8.44 p.m. I will now turn it over to Mayor Weinberger for the Board of Civil Authority. Take it away, Mayor. Thank you, President Tracy. I will call the Board of Civil Authority into order at 8.44 p.m. and would welcome a motion from a councilor on the agenda. Councilor Pine. I move to adopt the agenda. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Paul. Any um, oh, actually, point of order, there is a motion to adopt and amend. <clears throat> so moved. Second. <laughs> Move. Point of order. Do do we not have to read the amendment or? Yeah, it's it's motion. on board box. Uh, motion to adopt agenda as amended, as follows: No changes for consent agenda item two point zero two resolution appointment of assistant election officials. Councilor Tracy. Second. All right, excellent. Um, any further discussion of the amended agenda? Uh, seeing none, we will go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And the motion carries unanimously. Um, that brings us to item 2.01, which is a motion to accept the consent agenda. Um, is any counselor ready to make such a motion? Councillor Stromberg. I move to adopt the consent agenda and take the actions indicated. Thank you. Is there seconded by Councillor Freeman? Um, discussion. Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. The consent agenda is adopted. And that is the only item of business um, bringing us to adjourn adjournment. If there's no objection, uh, I will order the Board of Civil Authority adjourned at 8.46 p.m. And we will move to a, the final um, other meeting of the night, which is the City Council with Mayor presiding. And uh, I would welcome a motion on the agenda for this meeting. I've called it to order at 8.46 p.m. I'd welcome a, a motion on, on the agenda. Councilor Pine. 
I uh, would move to adopt the agenda as amended as follows. Rescind Chris Cadu's application for agenda item 3.04 per Chris Cadu. Second. Is there any further discussion on the agenda? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Um, to encourage counselors to have their microphone unmuted for the votes. Um, <clears throat> next item is uh, the consent agenda. Um, welcome motion on the consent agenda. Councilor Stromberg. I'd move to adopt the consent agenda and take the actions indicated. Thank you, Councilor Stromberg. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilor Freeman. Thank you. Uh, discussion of the consent agenda. We'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. And that um, <clears throat> brings us to three point oh one. So this section, we have three um, <clears throat> Board of Commission seats to fill. We'll start with 3.01, which is the Design Advisory Board. Um, and I would welcome that the floor is open for a nomination for the Design Advisory Board. Councilor Pine. I would place a nomination in the name of J. A. White. Excellent. Are there any additional nominations? <clears throat> Any additional nominations? If there are none, we will close the floor to nominations. And um, uh, I will ask for a voice vote um, uh, for the appointment of Mr. White to the Design Advisory Board for a term expiring June 30th, 2023. All those in favor of the appointment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Congratulations, Mr. White. Thank you. Thank you for your interest in serving on the DAB. We'll now move, um, I'm sorry, uh, we do have a custom of inviting applicants to speak to the, to the board. If Mr. White, I'm just uh, checking. Yeah. Mayor, I looked for, Ms. for uh, Jay White and I was not able to find him. Um, and then our, the next on the next one, I know that um, Professor Seguino is um, not on the call. Let me know that um, was not planning to speak. Okay, um, great. I do see that our applicant for the final position uh, uh, is with us. So if she wants to be recognized, um, Grace will be coming to you in a moment. But um, we have made the vote on 3.01. Now let's go to 3.02. This is an appointment to the police commission for a term expiring June 30th, 2022. The floor is open for nominations. Councilor Pine. I'd like to place in nomination the name of Stephanie Seguino for the police commission. Thank you, Councilor Pine. Um, sorry, Councilor Paul, if you were trying to be recognized there, I was sort of blocked for a moment. Um, uh, any additional um, nominations? Are there any additional nominations? Uh, seeing none, um, I'll close the, the floor. And um, since Professor Squino is not with us tonight, is there any, um, she will not speak, but as was noted, any, any further discussion? <clears throat> okay, if not, we'll go to a vote. Uh, all those in favor of the appointment of Stephanie Seguino to the Police Commission for a term expiring June 30th, 2022. Please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Um, thank you uh, and congratulations to Professor Seguino. Thank you for your service. Um, <clears throat> this now does bring us to 3.03. Uh, this is a Board of Registration of Voters um, appointment. Uh, for a term expiring um, next <clears throat> or June 30th, 2021. Um, I do see that Grace Grundhauser, who has filed an application, is, is here. Um, and Grace, your microphone has been enabled, I believe, if you... Hi, thank you for 
for hearing my application. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? We can, and yes, if you have any brief remarks for the board before the vote, go for it. Yeah, um, I'll just say I'm excited to support the board's work, um, especially efforts to help people to vote and increase registration rates. Uh, I'm just excited to help make my neighbor's voices heard. Great, thanks so much, Chris. Thanks for your interest in the board. Um, the floor is now open for nominations. Um, we have, Grace has not yet been nominated, I don't believe. So, Councillor Pine. I would like to place the nomination in the name of Grace Grundhauser. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Pine, uh, any other nominations? Okay. Uh, seeing none, we'll close, uh, close the floor to additional nominations. And is there any discussion on this appointment? Seeing none, we will go to a vote. All those in favor of appointing, appointing Grace. Grundhauser to the <clears throat> Board of Registration of Voters, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Um, thank you, Grace, for your interest and your service in our elections. And uh, we very much appreciate it. And with that, um, we have completed the agenda. And unless there is an objection, um, I will adjourn the City Council of Mayor presiding at 8.53 p.m. Thank you, President Tracy, back to you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so we will reconvene the regular City Council meeting. Um, we left off at item 6.02, which is another appointment, um, an appointment for the Chittenden Solid Waste District alternate, term expiring 5.31.22. I believe we had one um, applicant, uh, Samantha Hurt. Um, I believe Samantha is with us this evening. Um, so um, as, is, as we've done with the others, I'm gonna go ahead and allow, enable your mic, Samantha. And um, if you'd like to address the board, um, or I mean the council, you may do so um, with some brief remarks. Thank you, council president. Um, hi everyone, my name's Sam. Um, I spent several years working in the legislature to um, either affect or adopt new policies specifically around Vermont's solid waste system. So my main interest right now is seeing how Chin and Solid Waste is working with those new policies. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so now the floor is open for nominations. Councilor Hansen, go ahead. Yeah, I would like to nominate um, Samantha Hurt. Okay, thank you. Are there any other nominations? Any other nominations? Okay, we'll go ahead and close that and go to a vote. All those in favor of Samantha Hurt for the alternate on the CSWD board, um, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Congratulations to Samantha and all the other applicants. We all appreciate you all um, being willing to serve your city um, on these boards and commissions. It's really helpful to have a full slate um, in all the different roles. Um, so that brings us on to item 6.03, um, the resolution regarding the safe operation of contained outdoor fire pits. I'm going to recognize Councillor Shannon for this item. Go ahead, Councillor Shannon. Thank you, President Tracy. I'd move to adopt the resolution with the following changes to lines 15 and 16, which shall read, establish a process whereby property owners can apply for a seasonal permit from November 1st, 2020 to April 30th, 2021 to burn clean, dry firewood outdoors in smokeless fire pits if they meet criteria established by the Burlington Fire Chief and ask for the floor back after a second. Thank you for that, Councillor Shannon. Um, is there a second to Councillor Shannon's motion? Seconded by Councillor Mason, you have the floor, Councillor Shannon. Uh, thank you, President Tracy. I appreciate the concerns that um, were raised by the Board of Health and others 
In response to that, I sought input from my constituents about a possible compromise to allow smokeless fire pits. While only a very small minority of about 80 responses were opposed to outdoor fire pits, I think it's important to address what those concerns were. Um, and I really wanna emphasize that, that the fact that only a minority object to this um, doesn't in itself mean that we should go ahead with it because there are very legitimate concerns. But I also think that the concerns that have been raised are being addressed through this resolution. Some were concerned that the law would not be obeyed, but we know the current law is not obeyed. Wouldn't it be reasonable to offer our residents legal guidelines and education as to how to safely have outdoor fires and minimize impacts to neighbors? That is what this resolution offers. There was also much concern about equity and cost, which is a topic also touched on by the Board of Health, which I will get to in a minute. Those objecting based on equity tended to want us to allow all fire pits, not just smokeless fire pits. The Board of Health objected to our proposal based on one, fine particulate matter and chemicals emitted by backyard wood fires can affect our outdoor and indoor air quality and can affect the same population that's at higher risk for COVID-19. Um, first, to be clear, fire pits of any kind do not cause COVID-19, um, but they are an irritant to anyone who has any kind of a lung condition. The smokeless fire pit has a secondary burn of particulate matter, the thing that is irritating to those with lung conditions. And it burns that particulate matter before it goes up in the smoke, which is what it eliminates the, um, uh, the vast majority of, of the smoke. In doing so, they produce greater heat and far less smoke. Smokeless fire pits burn at higher temperatures and are more efficient. They put out more heat for the same amount of fuel used, conserving resources. Many residents prefer to burn wood rather than fossil fuels for a variety of reasons. Uh, the second thing that was mentioned by the Board of Health was outdoor fires might actually encourage larger gatherings than are currently permitted. This was not something I heard raised as a concern by the, by the community. But if this were to happen, there we do have a remedy for people who are, um, you know, we, we have regulations about not having too many people gather outside and, and whether that's caused by a fire pit or something else, the remedy to that is the same and um, we need to enforce that rule. Um, the purpose is to allow people to socialize outside, which we know is safer than socializing inside. The outdoor fire is far better than gathering around the currently legal indoor fireplace or wood stove. Third, not all neighbors will be not all neighborhoods will be suitable for outdoor fires, particularly in areas with many multifamily dwellings and small to no yard space. But not all neighborhoods have yards big enough for swing sets or charcoal grills either, but we don't ban them. Hopefully every swing set and charcoal grill is enjoyed not just by the owner, but by friends and relatives, which is also the hope with smokeless fire pits. Lastly, in regards to cost, the cost is typically about $275, which is comparable to the cost of a gas grill. And we don't ban those based on cost. So it doesn't seem like that is a fair reason to ban smokeless fire pits. Right now, many of us go to our friend's house outside of Burlington and enjoy fire with friends. This allows us to visit friends in, this, this resolution will allow us to visit friends have friends visit in Burlington and enjoy fires either at our own homes with friends or at a friend's home. Burlington residents are enjoying fires in their home fireplace, which is far more inequitable and smokier than a smokeless fire pit, but we don't ban them. I hope you will all join me in this compromise for the community as just one additional opportunity to help people to have friends over outside and socialize during this very difficult time. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Shannon. Um, I don't have any other councillors in the queue. Are there uh, Councillor Pine to be followed by Councillor Paul and Jane? Go ahead, Councillor Pine. I got you, Councillor Hightower, as well. Thank you, Mr. President. I um, when I saw this change um, come through as an amendment, I uh, reached out to someone who I've been talking with who has a uh, master's in public health and he specializes in respiratory health, especially with vulnerable populations. He serves on our board of health. His name is Ian McHale. I just spoke with Ian a little while ago tonight to find out if he knew enough about the smokeless technology. And he said he actually does know a fair amount about them and he understands the science and that there is still a fair amount of particulate matter generated by a smokeless um, fire pit. So it is not truly smokeless. He described it as primarily a, um, you know, a recombustion process that does burn some amount of the particulate matter, but that it is not um, smoke free, even though smokeless makes you think it's smoke free. Um, fine particulate matter doesn't need smoke to travel and become airborne. Um, and so his assessment, and by the way, he said that the concept was raised um, at the Board of Health meeting of going to smokeless fire pits, and they still issued their recommendation, which is that we, uh, for public health purposes, uh, is, as tempting as it is, as healing as it is, as mom and apple pie as a fire pit sounds, um, this is not really a direction that I think we should be taking in terms of um, our, one of our main mandates as elected officials, I believe, is protecting public health and safety. And so I still think that this is uh, the wrong direction to go. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Pine. I have Councillor Paul to be followed by Councillors Jang and Hightower. Go ahead, Councillor Paul. Thank you. Thanks, President Tracy. Um, so, um, you know, I, uh, um, I agreed um, when this first came to the council to uh, co-sponsor it, I thought it was a good idea. Um, uh, I think that one of the things that I was concerned about, and I'm glad that um, others made a motion to refer this to the Board of Health, is that I think we do need to look at that um, uh, and, and appreciated the comments, very thoughtful comments that they came back with, a full report in pretty record time, if you think about it. We, we don't we don't get reports done that quickly. Um, the, the the question that I have is that um, you know over the weekend I reached out to um, uh, Director Bill Ward and to Chief Locke, who's on the meeting, um, and asked both of them: um, Are smokeless fire pits already allowed in the city of Burlington? Um, so you don't have to go through any you know, is it necessary for us to have a resolution to talk about these smokeless fire pits if, are they already allowed anyway? And the answer that I got from the, from both, um, although um, Director Ward did ask me to defer to Chief Locke was yes, that those are allowed. So I guess my question is if they are already allowed, then, I'm not really sure I understand. Um, I'm not really sure I understand the 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 the, the resolution. And I, I see that Chief Locke is raising his hand and I hope President Tracy he might be able to speak to that. Sure. Go ahead, Chief, if you'd like to address that. Uh, good evening, everyone. And and Councillor Paul, I may have um, been quick to give you the answer. So what is permitted for smokeless is a gas uh, gas appliance. So a gas burning fire table is an appropriately uh, allowed or permitted uh, type of device. What Councillor Shannon and I have been discussing are what is considered what is called or sold as a smokeless fire pit, which burns natural wood products. So two different, um, I guess, two different definitions of smokeless. So gas, uh, gas fired appliances, propane fired appliances, those are permitted. These natural wood burning um, that are sold as a smokeless fire um, de device are not allowed. So what we're talking about is a natural what did you say? A natural wood burning? So it burns, it burns wood, natural wood. So it's just like it's taking firewood and burns it in a 
I, I think uh, Councillor Pine described it well as a, a, a tub that has a dual combustion. And so it, it, it emits way less smoke, although, as he described, it still does put out some particulate. Okay, so in other words, they're not, I'm just trying to understand so I, so I know, they're not, they're, they emit less smoke. They're not smoke less. I, so I have never seen one. I mean, I've seen, I've seen them in the store and I've seen them set up. But I've never seen one burn. I've heard described that there's very little s s smoke that comes out of them or this, I think someone sent us a note um, that they are closed and even smell like smoke after being around them. I personally have not witnessed that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I feel like, uh, you know, the, um, what I've been told, and again, I don't have one and I have only been around them are propane and, um, electric and gas are smokeless. And they're all, and they're, and they're all less. Okay. So, you know, my suggestion would be if we're going to do anything with smokeless, that they be truly smokeless. Um, and I would support that. Um, I, again, I, I'm not familiar enough with how these other ones work, um, but I think if we're going to respect the work of the health, uh, the Board of Health and um, the number of people that have on, on both sides of this, who, who, some who want them, some who would prefer not to um, have them, that we just have smokeless ones. So I don't know exactly how to do that in the resolution, but that would be my suggestion um, that perhaps um, smokeless be defined. What is smokeless? And it sounds to me like what is smokeless is uh, propane, gas, or electric. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paul. I have Councillors Councillor Cheng next to be followed by Councillors Hightower and Carpenter. Uh, Councillor Cheng. <laughs> Um, thank you, President. And I was just wondering if Ian or a member of Board of Health is in attendance, is watching the meeting, and if they can be promoted here as well. So, Councillor Jang, I do not see um, Ian McHale, and I'm not sure that I see any other members of the Board of Health. Okay, wonderful. And I almost reach out to you to request that, but this is all good. I think Councillor Carpenter, Councillor Paul, and myself did attend the last meeting and they made a deliberation. After the deliberation, Ian made it clear, which is what Councillor Pine is reference, referencing to, um, that those smokeless fire pits are not smokeless per se. They still burn wood, they still generate some amount of smoke, right? And they will be sending particles on the environment. I think it was very clear. And it is just, it is just, um, I just cannot, I just cannot understand how, what Board of Health have told us and made it very clear how it is now changed in a way, uh, changing this resolution. I think it's not, it's not the way we should do business. The way we should do business is to rely on data and science. And I want to appreciate again the stand from Hightower to send this resolution to Board of Health. Now, the question that I have is for Chief Locke, and this is specific to those who are currently using wood burning smoke less, a uh, wood burning fire pit. What is the department doing in enforcing that those are not allowed in this city? It, may, it, it, it became clear to me from many of my constituents that many people are doing it. But what is the, where is the level of enforcement and how can we get there? This is a question for Chief Law. Sure. So I'll tell you our level of enforcement is complaint based only or if we witness it. We do not do roving patrols for these. Um, so Ultimately, I'll say year to date, as of last week, we had responded to 170 open fire complaints. About 70 of those were in the New North End, and the ones in the New North End, the vast majority are at Letty Beach. Outside fires are a problem for us, but um, but again, we are not out roving 
on roving patrol for them. When uh, they when we receive a call, a complaint, we do investigate it and ask the and almost always, you know, they're little typically small backyard campfires and or a fire on the beach. And we uh, either extinguish them ourselves or we ask the homeowner to extinguish them. So that has been our posture um, and uh, and what we continue to do today. Okay. So and I would say from an edu- from an educational standpoint, um, every year since I've been here, and Councillor Paul can probably back me up because she, she and I typically have this conversation in the spring as we put out a front porch forum post and usually social media post about what is uh, what is permissible and what is not permissible. But um, that is, uh, uh, to be quite honest, that's the, ex- the extent of our enforcement. Okay. All right. So um, is it also true that in, 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 in your investigation, if you find, for example, my neighbor using smoke in his backyard um, and you ask question, this is not allowed. But when my neighbor tells you, I am using this for cooking, or I'm using this to burn this small, you, you, that is allowed from what, no, I, what I'm hearing. No, sir. So if you are burning wood for fire, for cooking fire, that is not permitted. That is something. So again, we we're talking, uh, Councilor Shannon and I today, we're talking about the ordinance. But our direction to our staff is any fire of natural wood products is not permissible. You can have a charcoal fire. You can have a smoker smoking, uh, cooking using a smoker, which puts out a lot of smoke. We do. We we allow that. We don't. We because that's uh, that that is a listed device, approved device used for cooking. No different than a than a gas grill. But if you were cooking on an open flame in the backyard, we would make you extinguish that. Okay. Wonderful. Um, thank you. So I think, you know, to this resolution again, I think initially I loved it. I liked it, not just because of COVID, but it is just something that I would want to use and that I see also other people use, you know, in the spring and also the summer. And I think with this process, I even learned that actually uh, gas fire pits are already allowed. So basically anyone who want to do it can do it anytime. It's not only during covid or any time. And I think based on the recommendation from the Board of Health, I don't see myself supporting this resolution as we move forward. Um, but I wanna also thank Councillor Shannon for her leadership and advocacy bringing this forward. Um, no further questions or comments for me. Thank you. Thank you. I have Councillor Hightower <laughs> be followed by Councillor Carpenter on first round. Go ahead, Councillor Carpenter. Thanks. Um, I'm sorry, Councilor Hightower. Oh, That's what I thought. Okay. <laughs> um, thanks, uh, President Tracy. So, um, also just want to one, I didn't ask the Board of Health if I could send this to them before I did. So, do you want to thank them for their very fast turnaround and getting this in? Um, and also, when I saw this, I also this resolution. I thought it was a really smart, practical thing to implement during COVID. Um, obviously, we, we first got a lot of complaints on the smoke, then on the safety. And I appreciate Councillor's amendment to make these smokeless fire pits. Um, but I also just quickly Googling this, the price range of that is $2,500. So I think it's unrealistic to say that this is a one year trial because I just don't see people getting rid of them um, after a year when they invested that much into them. So I, I'm, I, and also I don't completely understand what we're changing if it's currently complaint driven because it sounds like if somebody complains about it, now they'll be gone and if somebody complains about it in the future they'll be gone so practically i don't know what we're changing i appreciate the spirit of this resolution and i'm torn because it seems like such a small thing to argue about but when i'm torn i think i tend to base it on my constituent feedback which has been very large and very negative um none of my constituents have other than one who's like, oh, that sounds cool. Everybody who has contacted me has said, I don't want this. So I'm gonna have to vote no. Thank you, Councillor Hightower. Now, Councillor Carpenter. Thanks. Um, I appreciate this. And I, I too thought this was really a great idea. I'm, I'm a long time alumnus of Camp Oshalega and I love a good fire. I love a fire in my backyard tonight, but um, I really have opened my eyes to 
the concerns. And I think while this was done in such good faith, um, it really isn't isn't working. And I think perhaps what we need to do is step back, maybe look at our regulations, do a little more study of as to whether smokeless fire wood burning are really smokeless. I agree with um, Councillor Hightower. I would not want a constituent to buy one for one winter and then be told to get rid of it. Um, so I think that's something could take a little look and they might not be feasible. Uh, I'm well, well aware of the fires at Letty Beach and appreciate Chief Locke's attention. In fact, the Parks Department has talked about maybe Letty Beach and the other public beaches where they're located could and should have limited um, fire permits rather than disallowing them, allow them. I think that's something we ought to look into into the future as well. So I'm just thinking this is not the right time for this particular resolution. Maybe we step back and look at the one we've got and see whether it can be focused a little bit more. Um, perhaps there's ways to get special permits for, I'm gonna call them public fires, for light, which a lot of communities do allow. Um, so I think just tonight and doing this just for COVID is, is probably not gonna work for me. And if there's other ideas to broaden it, then we should pursue those. Thank you, Councilor Carpenter. Anyone else on first round? Uh, Councilor Mason, go ahead. Thank you, uh, President Tracy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I seconded the motion and was a sponsor, but um, I, I echo everything that pretty much has been said. Um, I did not realize smokeless truly meant, you know, uh, wood burning, but without smoke. I mistakenly assumed that uh, it solved the issue that the Board of Health had identified because it was a propane based um, product. So um, as much as I appreciate all the efforts, uh, I will not be supporting this. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Paul, go ahead. You're on mute. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I just wanted to sort of give a, a positive spin on this um, because I think there are there's a lot to be said for the fact that this resolution has brought to light the fact that we are all looking for ways to help our neighbors, to help um, those of us, particularly those of us who are very isolated. And you know, we we started this time of COVID in March, and I think. Many of us, I know myself, thought, well, March, you know, it's already almost getting to be spring. You know, I, I, we, you know, we can do this. Well, now it's getting into winter and we are going to have a full winter um, under these circumstances. And so I think it's, I think it's um, greatly to our credit that we are looking for ways to help people be outside and be able to socialize. The good news is, and there is good news, and that is that there are um, devices that you can now use that are smokeless, truly smokeless. Um, we don't need anything more than the fact that they are in our ordinance and we can use some of them. And I think that we as a council and as a community and perhaps the fire um, department should all be out on Front Porch Forum letting people know what we can do. Maybe not what we can't do, but letting people know what we can do. And, you know, if, um, you know, some of these devices are pretty cool and uh, um, could be used this this winter, next winter, and many winters to come. So, um, you know, I would just try to leave it with um, with that. Um, you know, given the language that's in the resolution, um, you know, I can't support it as it is, and um, we'll be voting no. But I think that we should all um, look at this also as as a positive as well. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paul, anyone else? Okay, Councillor Shannon, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just want to address some of the things that I heard and I am disappointed that apparently councillors didn't know that there was particulate matter in smoke and I seem to have wasted a lot of your time with this effort. Um, I, I may be the only person here who's actually experienced a smokeless wood stove. And I am also um, possibly the one who is most affected by wood smoke. 
I take multiple inhalers every day. Um, I have had a uh, breathing capacity less than 20%. Um, and that was at a time that I didn't go to hospital. I have been to the emergency room many times with respiratory illness. And I am very um, sensitive to the interests of those of us who are irritated by smoke because I am very, very much one of those people. And I think that that's the primary argument that we are having here. The smokeless fire pit is not 100% smokeless. If I am standing over it, I um, experience some smoke that causes some irritation. But if I were probably five to 10 feet away from it, it would be undetectable. Unlike a charcoal grill, which is legal and emits smoke, unlike a smoker, which is legal and emits smoke. The smoke from this type of appliance is far less. Um, some people didn't want to burn fossil fuels and that's why they supported the, the fire pit concept um, rather than going with the propane um, that is suggested. Others are concerned with the, you know, just having propane tanks um, concerns a lot of people. Um, the price, I, I couldn't hear exactly what Councillor Hightower said. I thought you said like $500, um, but I may have misheard that. It's, it's about 275. It is something you could sell if uh, they're very popular, if, um, you know, when they were no longer needed. And the idea that we would um, do more study on this, I would say, I think we've had enough. We have a lot of important issues on our table. I thought that this was broadly supported by this council, judging by the number of co-sponsors who jumped onto this. And I'm sorry that when we got to the table, that seemed to not be the case. I. Um, you know, the idea that this is not the right time, this is the very time to, um, to encourage people to socialize outside and do something like this. Um, if we're not going to do it now, I think there is not the political will to move this forward. And I would not ask the council to waste more time on this issue. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councilor Shannon. Um, Councilor Jang, go ahead. Yes, it will be very quick. And um, I think it's also important to just think about the health and well-being of others. You know, um, I think also the health of our environment. And we are known as a very progressive, forward-thinking and environmental, you know, minded city. And this uh, the fact of burning wood is, is an issue. And on top of that, that wood also might impact your neighbors from the next third, fourth, or fifth doors next to your house. Um, personally, I want to listen to my constituents, even though I love, I love it. Even just a regular firewood with a lot of smoke, I want to have it. But for um, health concerns, I should not undermine the well-being of others. Now, if you bring an amendment to this resolution that will allow having a trial phase on Ward 5, your ward, I would consider voting in support of it. But what my constituent, the people that I represent, they made it clear to me, they don't want it. So I have to listen and uh, act upon what people want and what makes sense based on the recommendation from our Board of Health. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cheng. Um, I don't have anyone else in the queue, so we'll go to a vote. Um, will the, the CAO please call the roll? Yes, sorry. All right, Councillor Carpenter. No. Councillor Cheng. No. Councillor Freeman. No. Councillor Hansen. No. Councillor Hightower. No. Councillor Mason. No. Councillor Paul. 
No. Councillor Paulino. Councillor Paulino, I couldn't hear you. No. Councillor Pine. No. Councillor Shannon. Yes. Councillor Stromberg. No. City Council President Tracy. No. 11 nays, one aye. The resolution fails and we are now on to our final agenda item, um, which is item 6.04, communication from our CIO, uh, Brian Lowe, regarding the retitling and reclassification of the opioid policy manager position to the public health equity manager position. Do we have CIO Lowe with us this evening? There we go. Yes. Welcome, CIO Lowe. Appreciate having you here with us this evening. Um, why don't you kick us off with this item and just give us a brief introduction before we um, go to a motion? Will do. Um, I think I'm, you know, obviously very excited to be here tonight and appreciative of the opportunity. Um, this is an important position that's um, both old and new for the city. It is a reclassification of a position held previously by Jackie Corbley. Um, important things to note for the council are that the position um, will move the, um, from the police department to the innovation and technology department, and it will be reclassified to focus on three specific areas. Um, those areas are leading and supporting the work of the city and the partners who've declared racism a public health emergency, um, in the assisting of a plan for the city's racial health equity work, um, examining and expanding the city's public health capacity, and continuing to support the city's work to respond to the opioid epidemic. Um, I do think, uh, Council President Tracy, I have a, um, if it's helpful, I can share my screen and show what the Board of Finance amended on the job description for the full council um, very briefly, and also note um, Councilor Hansen's comments as well. Yes, if you could please do that, CIO, that'd be really helpful. Okay. Hang on just a moment. And are you able to see this clearly? Uh, yes. Okay. So I just, I wanted to flag for the council quickly, a couple um, small but important clarifications from the Board of Finance and Councillor Hansen. The first is that this is actually a regular service, not a limited service position. Um, the second is a, a clarification from Councillor Hansen. The second highlight here, um, including language that is not, that was not in the um, job description initially, um, or was uh, eliminated in the transfer to, to add in language and other drug abuses in our community. Um, the other changes are later in the job description, um, emphasizing systemic issues um, such as racism and economic inequality, uh, and a clarification from the Board of Finance that um, the individual must be self-motivated and self-directed, language that had been in the job description previously and was restored. Uh, and then finally, this final edit here, adding in a clause under the um, qualifications and basic job requirements, noting um, a preference for individuals with experience related to drug abuse uh, reduction. I'm gonna stop my share here. Excellent, thank you for walking us through those changes and making sure we're all clear on those. Um, anything else to add, CIO Lowe? I'm happy to keep it brief here and take questions if that's, if that's helpful. Um, and I defer to the mayor if he has additional comments as well. Okay, excellent. Well, let, let's um, I, let's hold off on those um, for now and go to a motion. I'm gonna come to Councillor Paul for a motion on the item and then we can get into discussion on the position and the item. So Councillor Paul, if you could please move this. Yes, I'm happy to do so, uh, President Tracy. Um, there is a change to the recommended action just in case people are reading it. Um, I would make a motion to authorize the reclassification and retitling of the opioid policy manager position, a, a regular service, full-time exempt non-union grade 21 position to a public health equity manager position, a regular service, full-time exempt non-union grade 21 position 
and to authorize the chief administrative officer to move the associated reallocation of funding from the police department to the innovation and technology department. Um, I so move. Thank you, Councillor Paul. Is there a second to that? Seconded from Councillor Pine. Did you want the floor back, Councillor Paul? I, I would for just a second, uh, President Tracy. Um, my internet wasn't exactly working as well as I would hoped uh, would have hoped, um, and I wasn't sure. Um, uh, this is for CIO Director Lowe. Um, whether or not you had mentioned the other changes that were uh, discussed uh, tonight at the Board of Finance, we had quite a robust discussion about this, and just wanted to make sure that the limited service, because I just, it just went out at that moment. The, the limited service was changed and also the um, item on the top of page four, of uh, page Correct. three. Correct Those on were, both counts. Um, okay. the, the corrections from the Board of Finance around the regular service and the um, self-starter are both included now. In the, okay. In the As job well. description I showed the council. Okay, all right, wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, that that's That's all, President Tracy. Go ahead. Wonderful, thank you, Councilor Paul. Um, Mayor Weinberger, did you wanna go now or were you looking to hold off on your comments? Um, President Tracy, I, I think I'll uh, just, um, uh, I'll wait and see what the, the questions are. We did like was today to have an extensive conversation with the Board of Finance, I'd like to you know, respond as uh, the council would like here. Okay, understood, all right, so are there any counselors who have questions or would like to speak to this, this reclassification? Councilor Hansen. Yeah, just very briefly. Um, I'm supportive of this um, and I, I appreciate um, the administration for incorporating the feedback and just making sure that we're still keeping a focus on um, treating um, addiction and, and drug abuse issues um, as a public health issue and keeping this position focused on that as they also incorporate um, a focus on systemic racism and, and uh, inequality more broadly. So yeah, I, I think this is a, a good step in the right direction. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hansen. Any further comments or questions from counselors? Okay, Councilor Paul, go ahead. Thank you. Just wanted to, um, I just wanted the full council to know that uh, after the discussion at the Board of Finance, um, the vote was unanimous. Okay, uh, Councilor Friedman, go ahead. Thank you. Um, and I know this was discussed a little bit at Board of Finance, um, but I just wanted a chance to ask you directly, um, Mayor Weinberger. Um, I was just curious, this position is being moved out of BPD, but then there I believe the administration's stance is that the new social worker positions would be in the Lincoln Police Department. So I'm just wondering why, um, why? Okay. Why we're moving this position now? Sorry? I'm sorry, I thought you were finished, go ahead. Oh, no, I just, why we're moving this position out and then would potentially be adding two more. Great, so, um, so this position um, uh, it has been uh, largely focused um, in sort of historically a, a good percentage, a large percentage of, of this uh, uh, Jackie Corbley's time when she served this position was on the kind of policy and um, uh, <clears throat> organization um, efforts re regarding the city's opioid response around community stat. Um, the vision here for this position is that that work, that kind of policy and coordination work will, will continue on opioids and similar work um, will take place uh, organizing a, a, a separate um, effort, multi-agency effort um, to combat uh, racism as a public health emergency. And then kind of third area of policy and analysis work around um, uh, potentially expanded public health uh, uh, efforts uh, in general um, from the municipal level. 
Um, so it is true that historically, um, uh, Jackie did do non you know, significant amounts of, of field work and um, direct engagement with people who uh, were suffering from opioid use disorder, direct work to get people help, to get people into treatment. Um, and uh, that work um, must continue. In fact, uh, you may remember, we'd like to, when you think back um, just a, <clears throat> A couple of weeks ago to the presentation we made about where we go from here with the opioid um, crisis, uh, we would like to expand the um, city's ability to engage directly with people suffering from OUD um, and follow up. It's, it's one of our sort of low barrier, uh, rapid um, access to MAT efforts that we don't think has met its full potential is working with people who come into contact with the police department. Uh, so we'd like to see that continue, but uh, I don't believe that should continue from this. I think this position going forward will uh, really be focused on this policy, policy analysis, coordination with other agencies around um, a, a broader uh, scope or, you know, including the racism as a public health um, focus. And we should fill the, and, and, and that work, I think, um, makes sense to house at the, working with Brian uh, in the Chief Innovation um, Office, and we can expand on that more if that would be helpful. Uh, I see that work is pretty different going forward from here, from the direct uh, service work, which um, uh, you are right, Councillor Freeman. Um, the discussions up till now have been in, uh, proposing that that work be housed um, uh, at the police department, um, expanding our, our social work capacity at the police department. We have gotten you know, a range of feedback, some feedback very supportive of that and others uh, supportive of um, you know, questioning whether that should be the way uh, we go forward. That will be we're, we're taking that feedback, we're examining it, we're looking at other cities um, that are doing this kind of police transformation work and um, kind of grappling with that. That'll be a discussion for another night. Um, I, I do think it is, uh, you know, but it is sort of a separate issue from where this position should be housed. Um, I think the work, I do not, it was asked of the Board of Finance that this, we don't envision this position as supervising um, that, uh, those social, uh, those social workers. Um, I think it's, it's a, uh, even though there has been a link between these, uh, this work historically, I think going forward from here, um, uh, I, I don't think they need to be in the same department. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. I don't have anyone else in the queue. Okay. Uh, Councilor Jane, go ahead. Yes, um, I think I'm, I'm going to support this and uh, Board of Finance, like Council Paul said, it was unanimous, you know, but I think also we did and ask uh, great questions. And I think the discussion there was very um, interesting and important. And to me, it all comes down to uh, process around the issue we want to solve and also um, the, 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 the process also we need to take to get there, the structure, you know? And to me, since June, the passage of the Racial Justice Alliance, um, it might be now seven positions that were created or six, if you put um, Kyle Dutson, Dutson position in it, you know? And it's nearly six months and there has not been yet any substance in what we want to see that definitely combats racism at its core, right? The declaration of um, racism as a public health emergency was a good step, a good one. And the committee, our committee, which is the Racial Equity and Inclusion Belonging Committee, before even we heard about this position, we already directed our staff to track down all the 30 organizations that uh, signed on to the declaration and find a point person for each of those organizations in order for them to work with our committee and get things done. To date, there has not been a level of alignment 
and collaboration between the administration and that st standing committee. I think we could have provided feedback about this. To me, it is problematic when we restructure one social worker's job who was in the field doing direct service to those affected by um, the opiate and now housing that position, I mean, loading that position with all the items that are still not clear, right? And I think today, I don't even think there has been clarity about this position per se. But what I'm calling is just, we think about working together and working in collaboration with the administration and the committees that already exist that was passed by the city council. We have a lack of that. And I, this is a strong call um, as we move forward. And I think this is the second time um, there are two positions that are not hired yet that will be working with uh, Director Green. We brought up that issue, right? And I think it was recognized. And here is a new position. We were doing something similar, but it could have been um, um, uh, brought together for a greater outcome and maybe a stronger feedback, you know? Uh, yes, just wanted to say that and calling for that and strongly looking for that collaboration to really happen as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Jang. Anyone else? Seeing none, we will go to a vote on the motion uh, to reclassify the position of the opiate policy manager to the public health equity manager. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that passes unanimously. And that completes our deliberative agenda at 9.43, which is record time for us these days. And we'll move now into committee reports, which is something that we have not done in quite some time. Are there any committee chairs who would like to offer a report? Councilor Shannon, go ahead. Thank you, President Tracy. Um, the Charter Change Committee will be meeting um, tomorrow at 5.30 um, to discuss um, oversight of the police, um, which was referred to our, our committee. Um, and we've had a couple meetings about it already. Um, we asked the city attorney to um, give us um, some options as to how to proceed with that. And, uh, and we'll be discussing in more detail tomorrow. Um, the other thing that has been in our committee that we've had one meeting on, but we're kind of putting that on hold because um, we need to get this police oversight issue back to the council in, in a very short time, time frame, um, it, is the just cause evictions. So I expect we will be talking about just cause evictions on November 4th, though we haven't formally scheduled that meeting yet. Um, and uh, yes, welcome everybody's input on those topics. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Shannon, Councilor Jang. Yeah. Um, yeah, so on Wednesday, the 28th, 5.30, the Racial Equity and Belonging Committee will be meeting at 5.30 via Zoom. And in that meeting, we will be having a representative of CVOU, um, who also was hired as part of the Declaration of Racism as Public Health Emergency. Um, they hired a new director, executive director around racial equity and belonging. We will be hearing from her and outline ways that we can collaborate and work together as we move forward. And the second presentation will be from Vermont Center of um, Diversity, you know, which is a new organization um, that was created by a former refugee and also Jared Gung, who wrote a book, a, a great book about um, profiling refugees that settled here since uh, the 90s in, in, in Vermont. Um, so it will be interesting and uh, we invite people to show up in that committee because great discussions. I think both Councillor Pine and Councillor Paul suggested also we have an open forum at the end. And I think that's the only standing open forum that we have where 
it's not public forum, but a platform. And I think it's a discussion about everything happening, um, the, the aspirations, the work, things that are being done. I think it's interesting for councillors to show up there sometime. Uh, thank you. Wednesday, the 28th at 5.30 via Zoom. Thank you, Councillor Cheng. Councillor Pine. Thank you, Mr. President. The um, City Council Community Development and Neighborhood Revitalization Committee um, is meeting again on this Wednesday at 5.30. Um, as I like to say, same location. Um, and um, we are a, um, a continue to focus on the just cause issues. Um, in, even though it's really happening, uh, most of the action will occur at the uh, Charter Change Committee. Uh, but there are still, um, at least the committee members feel, a number of issues that really require uh, further discussion. We are being um, informed by research that was conducted um, by a research assistant who uh, we assigned to look at a bunch of questions. We um, uh, had, a, had a little bit of a hiccup with our committee as far as uh, publicly warning the meeting. Uh, there was a, a essentially a sort of an administrative um, glitch in, in that warning. It didn't occur. And so a meeting that we held in September uh, was in fact not publicly warned. And we, re, we revisited those issues in a public session today. I thought we had a very productive discussion about uh, the scope of work. What we decided was there will continue to be issues that will um, need to be explored in, in greater detail. The, uh, the issue of just cause evictions is um, it's pretty involved. It's, it's quite complicated when you dig into it. And so um, Councillors Hightower and Carpenter and myself, um, although I think we all have a certain amount of awareness and, and knowledge, um, we will need some help here going forward um, from both CETO and the city attorney's office. And we'll be, uh, we'll be asking for that help because it's, um, you know, there's, there's going to continue to be, I think, um, a need to, to grapple with some, some pretty challenging issues around um, that need to be discussed. But obviously, it'll end up in an ordinance committee if this gets uh, through a charter change and gets to the voters and gets approved and eventually comes back. So really, the hard work will, will land right on ordinance eventually. But um, there's a lot involved in this discussion. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pine. Any other committee chairs interested in giving a report? Councillor Hansen, go ahead. Sure, quickly. Um, the license and local control subcommittee, our next meeting is, is planned for um, November 4th at 4.30 p.m. We're gonna have a public, a formal public hearing um, on Orlando's due to some public complaints that we had received. Um, and then we're gonna have our normal meeting after that. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Hansen. Any additional committee reports? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to item number eight, which is uh, any commentary on general city affairs. Anyone interested in commenting on general city affairs? Councillor Paul, go ahead. Thank you, uh, President Tracy. I um, just wanted to uh, note, not necessarily a, a it sort of falls in between a committee report and uh, um, and general city affairs is um, uh, one of the items that was in the uh, 2018 resolution on overdose prevention sites was was that uh, the members the two counselors that were members of Comstat would be um, uh, coming to the council with updates um, and so just wanted to mention that uh, there was. As, as we all know, there was a resolution that we passed um, in uh, September uh, relating further to overdose prevention sites at the, um, at the Comstat meeting later that month, which was, I guess, about a week after that. We did discuss at length the resolution. Uh, City, um, State's Attorney Sarah George was there, as well as Jackie Corbley um, and Grace um, uh, from uh, um, Safe Recovery and uh, Grace Keller. And um, uh, so we talked about the resolution. Um, there was a lot of support um, for moving this issue forward at Comstat, which was, these are extremely well attended meetings. Um, and just wanted to also remind the council that um, 
As per the resolution, uh, the one of the resolve clauses was that the city attorney would report back to the full council by the first meeting in November uh, with an analysis in the form of a work session. So hope that we can all look forward to that. And then the next report will be um, later in December. So that's the update. Thank you. So thank you, Councilor Paul. Anyone else on general city affairs? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to council president update. I do not have any updates for you tonight. So I will move into our final item of the evening, which is the mayor's report. Go ahead, mayor. Thank you, President Tracy. Um, two, two updates from me tonight. Um, one, just uh, uh, I want to uh, hear uh, at the council, thank um, uh, the, every, the whole city team that was involved in getting us to Friday and Saturday's milestone, the reopening of City Hall Park. Um, any counselor, if you haven't had a chance to see the park, new park yet, um, you're in for a treat when you do get down there. The, uh, the two days of events went off very well, particularly Saturday when the weather was much better. Um, uh, with the possible exception of uh, uh, days um, with the farmer's market, Saturday uh, had um, just a, throughout the day, a large number of people coming through and, and the feedback, positive feedback about the improvements to the park was, uh, was great to hear um, for everyone who was involved in this essentially decade long effort to um, get to that accomplishment. Um, the, uh, the details of the park are, um, are, now that they are built and can be inspected are, are um, uh, really uh, <clears throat> uh, worth um, just they, they, there's vast array of them I think until the park is fully built and you can see it yourself it's hard to uh, grapple with how much change um, was implemented an example is the stormwater gardens where now substantial amounts of St. Paul Street are um, uh, treated uh, by the new stormwater gardens that have been built. So it was a great couple of days. Thank you to the whole city team. Almost every department was involved in one way or another and uh, it was a great day. Um, another major multi-departmental effort underway right now is, uh, but this one's certainly led by the clerk treasurer's office and Amy Bovey, um, uh, who, who leads our elections, is the um, uh, management of this unprecedented uh, election uh, that is being done um, through uh, ballots that have already been mailed uh, to um, every registered voter. Um, when I last got an update from Amy, about 10,000 uh, ballots had come in. That means that there are still uh, more than 10,000 ballots uh, that are, are out there. And I just want to make sure that the council is fully aware and the public is fully aware of all the different ways in which people can um, submit their ballots. There, there are more ways to vote this year than ever before. In addition, <clears throat> so to, to summarize them uh, quickly, and the, all this information is on the city's website, right at the homepage, there's a, a, a major link to all this voting information, but the, 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 the ways to vote until we are um, for a few more days, includes the U.S. mail. We are not re recommending that once we get closer than 10 days to election day that people continue to uh, send ballots through the mail, um, uh, even though uh, typically mail uh, sent out in Burlington gets to the clerk's treasurer's office in two days. If you're getting um, within uh, about 10, 10 days out, um, uh, we recommend that you look at one of the other options. Um, if you are aware, if you put your ballot in the mail and you want to confirm that it got there, you can actually do uh, go to an online link and see whether or not your ballot has been received. Um, the other options include three um, voting 24-7 uh, outdoor ballot boxes that are monitored and are emptied by the clerk clerk's office twice a day. They are in three locations around the city. Um, in addition, uh, Voters in the New North End, as of today, can um, go from 9 to nine a.m. to 3 p.m. We have staff at the Miller Center that will accept, uh, officially accept the ballot. Um, and then uh, finally, the other way to vote is the kind of the old fashioned way. You can go to your polling place on, um, on election day and um, 
uh, the, the polls, all, all eight um, wards will be open and receiving ballots. Uh, one additional way I neglected to mention is the clerk treasurer's offices uh, in city hall is also open and you can, uh, during business hours, you can receive, um, uh, you can you can drop off the ballot in, in city hall as well. So um, uh, for more, again, all that information is recapped on, on, the, on the webpage. And thanks again to our clerk's office for their hard work to um, make this a uh, really unusual election during COVID times successful. Uh, President Tracy, that's what I've got for tonight. Thanks for the chance to, to weigh in. Thank you, Mayor. That completes our agenda and a motion to adjourn is in order. Moved by Councillor Pine, seconded by Councillor Jang. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Good night. Okay, seeing none, we're adjourned at 9.57. Good night, all.